think if I can get everyone to take their seats, we're going to reconvene this meeting. Okay, we're reconvening this meeting from a prior meeting, and let's see, we're going to have results of closed or results and closed session. Results from closed session. That's easy for you to say. I know. Uh, um. We did have a closed session regarding initiation of litigation, and I need to report out that the city council unanimously authorized um, the city attorney and the city prosecutor to take abatement action and take the necessary actions for getting a receiver um, appointed for the cleanup of the 215, 217 North L Street. Oh, I'm sorry, 215 and 219. Okay, thank you. And now if you'll all please rise, remove your hats, and we're going to have an invocation by Pastor Kathleen Puntar. Let's have a moment of prayer. The earth awakens to new life, O oh God, and we receive hope and new energy. As the flowers break through the soil and bloom, we can break through our own challenges into new life. Renew us, O oh God, with your freshness. Open us to beauty. Thank you for the blessing of springtime, for the blessing of all that is new. Give us, O oh God, the courage of daffodils that peek their way out long before the cold is gone. Give us the spines of lupins who stand tall even in a breeze. Give us the joy of poppies blooming in impossible places. Give us the sweetness of strawberries. Give us the hope of budding leaves and flowers on trees. May we rejoice in all signs of new growth and new possibilities. We lift up prayers for all who are hurting, for all in your creation who suffer, for all who experience loneliness and hunger, violence, terrorism, and injustice. We pray your grace. We lift up our prayers for the city of Lompoc and for our Central Coast communities. We lift up prayers for this city council and we ask for guidance and wisdom and discernment in their decisions. God of wind and sky, of mountain and river, we give thanks for the precious gift of life. We bring before you our gratitude for the miracle of nature's beauty, of nature's rhythm, and for the breath of life. We praise your name. Amen. Amen. Please remain standing and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, um, several presentations during the past uh, week or two. Let's see, Councilmember Humdahl and Councilmember Vega presented City resolutions honoring Mimi Erland and the Santa Inez Band of Chumash Indians uh, at the, uh, let's see, uh, the um, Grove, Harbor Grove, Ar Arbor Grove, Arbor Day, on Saturday, March 19th, in recognition um, over at Beatty Park. And I presented a proclamation in Santa Maria for child abuse, listening, and meditation, calm, in honor of their I Will Not Be Silent campaign. And now it is my pleasure to present several other proclamations. <laughs> okay, if we can have someone from Child Abuse Prevention Month, Child Abuse. I'm well, thank you. Okay, this is a proclamation, Child Abuse Prevention Month. Whereas child abuse and neglect is a community condition and problem, and finding solutions depends on the involvement of the community and the people. Whereas the effects of child abuse and neglect are felt by whole communities and need to be addressed by the entire community. Whereas North County Rape Crisis and Child Protection Center has been committed to educating our community on child abuse and neglect prevention and are sponsoring several events throughout the month to heighten public awareness 
of the abuse and neglect of children in our community. These events will provide information and materials that support families to prevent child maltreatment and celebrate people who work with the community to help support these children and families. Whereas, effective child abuse prevention programs succeed because of partnerships created among social service agencies, schools, youth organizations, religious organizations, civic organizations, law enforcement agencies, and, business, and the business community and residents. Whereas, all citizens should become more aware of the importance of prevention in the community and become involved in supporting parents to raise their children in a safe, maturing environment. And whereas the full month recognition and re activities has been promoted by the North County Rape, Crisis, and Child Abuse Child Protection Center to increase awareness of child abuse and neglect that it creates. Now therefore, I, Bob Lengel, Mayor, City of Lompoc, do hereby proclaim April 2016 as Child Abuse and Neglect Prevention Month. Congratulations. Oh, that's right. I, you, she's just going to stand right here. Okay. <laughs> she gets a twofer tonight. I got a twofer. Okay, this is a proclamation, Sexual Assault Awareness Month. Whereas, sexual assault is an intolerable violent crime affecting victims slash survivors, their family members, significant others, neighbors, friends, and coworkers. And whereas, no one person, organization, or agency can eliminate sexual assault on their own, we must work together to increase public understanding of what can be done to prevent sexual assault and support the victims slash survivors. Whereas North County Rape Crisis and Child Protection Center has led the way in Lompoc since 1974 in addressing sexual assault by providing 24 hour hotline services, responding to emergency calls, offering support and comfort during the medical exams and criminal proceedings and empowering those impacted by the sexual assault to, to care for their loved ones. Whereas, ending sexual assault must include public and private efforts lead, led by the North County Rape Crisis and Child Protection Centers, including conversations about identifying sexual violence, ways to prevent it, and, and how to help survivors connect with crucial counseling and other support services. Whereas staff and volunteers of sexual assault programs in Lompoc work around the year around the year to end sexual assault and prevent and to support the survivors by providing prevention education and survivor empowerment informing inf information to schools churches civic organizations and to medical medical and health centers law enforcement agencies and the criminal justice personnel whereas north county rape crisis and child protection Center has set the important example on how forging collaborations, relationships between service agencies and organizations serve to improve the quality of life and services for most of the most, inf un most profound and directly impacted by sexual assault. Whereas North County Rape Crisis and Child Protection Centers request public support and assistance as it continues its effort to bring real hope for eliminating sexual assault in our city. Now therefore I, Bob Lingo, Mayor City of Lompoc, do hereby proclaim April 2016 as Sexual Assault Awareness Month. It's a mouthful, Mayor, I know. <laughs> Mayor Lingo, members of the City Council, good evening. I stand before you tonight a humbled Lompokian and servant of the people of this great city. Mr. Mayor, by presenting the North County Rape Crisis and Child Protection Center with these two proclamations, you've made it clear, along with your fellow city leaders, that Lompoc has had enough. You recognize the tragedy that occurs with each assault, the scars left behind with each instance of child abuse, and the innocence of our children lost when such abuse occurs. 
These statistics are alarming because one is too many. <laughs> As many of you walked into the city hall this evening, perhaps you had other agenda items on your mind. Perhaps you're here to speak either for or against another issue the city is facing. But hopefully what you couldn't escape was a visual reminder out front that child abuse in our city must end. While it saddens us to acknowledge that there were 655 referrals to child welfare services last year in Lompoc alone, we are energized by our Pinwheels for Prevention project. This visual reminder that each child matters is aimed at helping people start the conversation. We recognize that dealing with the issues that we do is not easy. Talking about the issues takes people out of their comfort zones. It's someone else's problem to deal with. We understand that level of uncomfortableness. But tonight, I challenge that thought process and ask you to challenge yourselves and invite you to join us. It's up to each of us individually and collectively to join together to say, enough is enough. Some of you might ask, how do I make a difference? And the answer is quite simple, get involved. Our agency cannot do this work alone. We need you. If you don't have the time, perhaps you have a few dollars to donate. Trust me, asking for money is never easy, but sadly, neither is our work. We are blessed to receive the support from the city of Lompoc. However, that money is never enough. We want to eventually work ourselves out of a job by teaching more, talking more, and helping more. If you own a business, belong to a service club, are the coach for a sport here in the city of Longpoke, ask us to join you for a discussion on how you can actively take a role in your community in ending violence against women, men, and children. If you are a citizen going about your daily lives, support law enforcement by reporting situations that give you the feeling that something just isn't right. Be an active bystander. We have numerous opportunities throughout the year and I invite you to call us. Walk across the street to 511 East Ocean. Follow us on Facebook and Twitter. Yes, we are that up to date in your city. Get involved with our fundraisers and activities. We're having a candlelight vigil in Lompoc on April 28th as we wrap up Sexual Assault Awareness Month. Join us, show your support. Many people think it can't happen to me, and I pray that you're right. But sadly and statistically, it has happened to someone you know. Help us change those statistics. But more importantly, help us make sure that we are around in years to come for those who might need us. Mayor Lingle and members of the City Council, thank you for helping us shine a light on issues of child abuse and sexual assault. We really appreciate your support. And thank you for everything you do. So. Okay. It's a proclamation for National Library Week 2016. Whereas National Library Week is a time to celebrate the contributions of our nation's libraries and the library workers and to promote li Oh, I'm sorry. Come on, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> We're still going to support you. No. So library workers and promote library <laughs> and support services. Whereas this year's theme, Library Trans Libraries Transform, personifies the ability of libraries to transform lives and communities by providing free access to technology, career development resources, and skills to help people thrive in, their, in this digital age. Whereas libraries provide free access to books, online resources for families, and businesses and the business center and help support enter, enter entrepreneurship and retraining. Whereas libraries and librarians open up the world of possibilities through innovation, uh, job seeking, resources, and the power of and through the power of reading. Whereas libraries are librarians are trained, tech savvy professionals providing technology training and access 
to downloading content like ebooks, and whereas libraries support democracy and the effort of social change through their commitment to provide equitable access to information for all library users, regardless of race, ethnicity, creed, ability, sexual orientation, gender identity, or social economic status. And now therefore, I, Bob Lingle, Mayor City of Lompoc, California, do hereby, hereby proclaim National Library Week, April 10th through the 16th, 2016. Thank you, Mayor and City Council. Um, I just want to encourage everyone to come to the library. Um, we have a lot of great things you might not know about. If you go on our social media, we're on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and Pinterest, and you can see kinds, the kinds of programs that we're offering. We do have programs for all ages, so adults, teens, children, you name it, we've got something for you and for your family, so please come see us. And next week, um, we are doing our Food for Fines. Um, so if you owe a little bit of money on your account and you'd like to help the community in the process, you can bring in a can of food for every dollar that you owe in late fines. And we will waive those fines and those, all of that food will go to the local food bank. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Sarah. And finally, Proclamation National Public Safety Telecommunications Week. Okay. She's working. She's working. How dare she? <laughs> okay. Whereas the Congress and the President of the United States have designated April 10th through April 16th as National Public Safety Telecommunicators Week, and whereas emergencies that occur at any time require the prompt response of police, fire, or medical services, and Whereas, the professional and dedicated public safety dispatchers of the Lompoc Police Department are the vital link between the residents or victims and the public safety providers who may save their life or the life of a loved one, apprehend a criminal, and or save the processions, possessions of your, of your family. Whereas, the public safety the public safety of our police officers and firefighters is dependent upon the quality of and accuracy of information received from the citizens who telephone the Lompoc Police Department Communication Center. Whereas the critical functions performed by these professional telecommunicators 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year, regularly go unrecognized behind the scene of the emergency and critical care critical event. Now, therefore, I, Bob Lingle, Mayor City of Lompoc, California, do hereby call upon the citizens of Lompoc, as well as the patriotic, civic, and educational organizations to observe National Public Safety Telecommunications Week and appreciate, and appreciate the ceremonies and observations we receive, receive here. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, members of the council and the audience. Those are some extremely special words that reflect the hard work that's done by the people behind the scenes. Most of the time, all you see on the street responding to emergencies are either the black and white units or the fire units uh, running code three or responding to a distress call. What you don't see are the incredibly talented, dedicated voices that sit over here in the dispatch center that make sure that our crews have the information they need on time before they get on scene, and some of them spend time on the phone with the folks that are needing help, walking them through, assuring them that help is on the way. Very seldom do we recognize our dispatchers, and we should be doing that every single day. I know the crews have special events planned to honor them during this week. So our hat is off to them. Without, without our telecommunicators, without our emergency dispatchers, we would not be able to deliver the level of service that we do. So thank you very much for the proclamation. Okay, thank you. Okay, now we'll move on to the city manager's report. 
Yeah, before the fire chief sits down, I'd just like to invite Chief Latipow back up to uh, do an introduction of our newest firefighter, Jacob Farley. Makes me seem small. <laughs> uh, indeed, uh, Mr. Manager, Mayor, members of the council, it gives me great pleasure to introduce our newest member of the fire department, uh, Jake Farley. Uh, Jake and his family. <laughs> Jake and his family are longtime residents uh, of the area. And as most of you know, we really uh, appreciate when we can hire somebody local uh, who's uh, come up through the ranks, so to speak, in the education system. Uh, Jake is a graduate of Cabrillo High School. He's a graduate of the Allen Hancock Academy, which is now just in our backyard. Uh, and he's a graduate of the North Greenville College and holds a bachelor's degree in business administration. Um, the, the talent that we are so blessed with in our department is absolutely incredible. And Jake is a compliment to an already talented team. And we hope that he'll be here for a very, very long time. <laughs> <laughs> so please welcome uh, with me, uh, firefighter Jake Park. Welcome, Jake. Okay, we are now going to move on to um, public comment on the consent calendar. This is your opportunity to speak to us for up to three minutes on anything on the consent calendar. Okay, seeing no one rise, we're going to close, close public comment and go to the consent calendar. The consent calendar are on the consent calendar items that are considered routine and will be approved by one motion by, of the council unless a council member chooses to pull an item. Does any council member wish to pull an item? Seeing none, could I have a motion? I move we accept consent. I'll second. Any discussion? Let's vote. And that passes 5-0. Okay, uh, staff presentations, announcements, special requests. Do we have anything? Nothing? Okay, we're gonna move on then to oral communication. And before we go to oral communication, I need to make a statement. At our last meeting, a citizen made us aware that changing the order on the uh, agenda is not necessarily in, a, in agreement with the uh, council handbook. So after reviewing it, I want to assure that citizen and the public that all changes that are made to the agenda in the future will be in abidance and it'll be a major, be at the consent of the supermajority of the council. So that'll takes effect immediately. Actually, it's been in effect. Okay, oral, communi or oral communication. Anyone that wishes to speak to the council on any item on the agenda? You have a maximum of three minutes to speak. If you just step forward to the uh, microphone up here. I'm sorry. Yeah, anything, yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, I had two things. One was Ryan Park deterioration of all the services over there from the parking lot. Could you state your name, please, sir? Donald Edward. I'm okay. a long-term resident for like 55 years, an engineer. And, uh, but anyway, I don't know if anybody's been paying attention to Ryan Park, but it's really deteriorating. The picnic tables are rottening. A lot of the stuff is damaged over there. All the surfaces, there's potholes everywhere. Somebody should go pay attention to it. The other thing, I'd like to provide a scientific view into this whole mess with this drag strip thing. And uh, in going on the internet, I find that the National <clears throat> Hot Rod Association has a wealth of information as far as the problems with drag strips. And it's interesting that in the last couple months, several cities have shut down their drag strips because of impending lawsuits, trying to settle lawsuits, and continuous complaints from citizens that are in the area. 
Now, one of the interesting things, Button Willow has their strip 10 miles away from town. Phoenix has their strip 15 miles away from town. The recommendation is seven to nine miles away from anything. Now, I don't know if the council has taken that into consideration because when I look at where I live on West Oak Avenue and the airport, it's like a half a mile away. And looking at the scientific pressure of DBAs, which I assume somebody's brought up in the relationship to the noise levels, and that's what it's all about, is the DBA levels. If you take 50 feet away from most of your stock cars, you're gonna be running in a neighborhood of 100 to 120 DBA. You're gonna take a mile away, you're still gonna be 90, okay? A relationship to this is 90 dBA is about the equivalent of sitting on your lawnmower. Now, I have a feeling there's going to be a lot of citizens that aren't going to be too happy about that. Now, right now, I can hear when they jump out of the planes, I can hear the wind going through their parachutes, hear them talking. What do you think it's going to do when I've got a 90 dBA level in my living room? And I have a feeling that the lawsuits that have been in Fontana, which they just shut down the Fontana uh, race strip last week. And uh, they also, Bakersfield, Irwindale, a whole slew of cities have shut down their drag strips because of the problem of people and noise levels not agreeing. Now, DBAs are something that is physics. You can't do anything about it. And it's going to be a feature. The question, I think, for all you people is going to be, who's going to provide the liability when the people in Mesa Oaks start suing the city for loss of value of their property due to that noise sweeping up that hill or the noise sweeping over the valley? You'll have to wrap it up real quick, sir. Okay. But anyway, I think the city needs to take a hard look at this, and the city attorney in particular, because this is a history of evolution of problems, and I don't see this getting any better. And I think the sooner the council realizes that they've got a problem and trying to push this uh, onto the city. Now, one of the things that was okay, used- Okay, sir, you only have three minutes, and I'm sorry, okay. but your time has expired, but thank All you very right. much for your comments. Okay, how do I get more time? Because I've got a whole list of questions, financial and scientific. Um, Unfortunately, during oral communication like this, you only have three minutes. So you I come back next meeting? Come back or yeah, get, the, get the information to one of the council members, you know. Okay. Okay, thank you. Or come back to the next meeting. So thank you, sir. Evening, council members, mayor. John Lynn, Chairman of Lompoc Valley Parks, Recreation, and Pool Foundation. I just want to assure the council that with regard to the noise, both for the Motorsports Park and the drag strip, a very in-depth noise study is being performed, both with local testing and with computer imaging of the whole valley. And um, anyone that wants to go online and look, please go to the International Hot Rod Association, not the National Hot Rod Association because NHRA runs vehicles with nitromethane, which is extremely loud, and those fuels, will, those specialty fuels will not be allowed at this strip. This strip is also a one-eighth mile strip rather than a quarter mile. So the run time is much shorter and the noise is much lower. So I thought you'd appreciate okay, some thank information. You. Anyone else? Okay, seeing no one rise, we're going to close oral communication. Bring it back to council for appointments. It's item number five on the agenda. And we have, looks like eight vacancies to the Economic Development Committee. So now we can do it a couple ways. I know several council members wanted to, yes. 
Mr. Mayor, members of council, I just did want to make one comment. At uh, the last meeting where we appointed, where the council appointed members, Julie Menacucci was appointed to a term that lasted one month. And um, I should have brought that to your attention at the time because she really would like to be appointed to a four-year term. So um, as you look forward to deliberating on uh, any appointments you may make today, I wanted to bring that to your attention um, since she really did not have an opportunity to serve uh, when the decision was made to make those appointments. And she has uh, expressed interest for quite some time and had her application in for quite some time. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Okay, so I know there's a desire for several council members to make a recommendation and nominate a certain individual. So does any council member wish to choose from this list or someone else? Council Member Vega. I'd like to um, appoint Mr. Richard Drago as my appointee for the Economic Development Committee. Okay, that's a motion. Do we have a second on that? Use your phone. I'll second that for you. Okay, it's been moved and seconded for Mr. Richard Drago. Any comments, con concerns? Okay, let's vote on that. Okay, that is five zero, and what's the yellow light for? I guess not. Okay, it's five zero. Someone has a yellow light on? Let me just clear all the lights real quick. Okay. Okay, let's vote again. Let's vote again. Okay, that passes 5 0. Okay, any other council member wishes to make an, a nomination? Council member Mosby. Yeah, on the point, Sue Schuyler. Second. Okay, it's been moved and seconded for Ms. Schuyler. Uh, any discussion? Uh, let's vote. That passes 5 0. Okay, let me just. Uh, any other council member? Uh, council member Starbuck. Yeah, I'd like to appoint Murray Day. Okay. Uh, do we need a second? Second. Okay, any discussion? Let's go ahead and vote. That passes 5 0. Okay, Council Member Homdahl, would you like to nominate someone? I was going to nominate Sue Schuyler, so but it's already been done. Okay, I'll go ahead and nominate Julie Menacucci. You need a second? I'll second. Okay, it's been moved and seconded. Any discussion? Let's vote. And that passes 5 0. Okay, so Councilmember Humdahl, do you wish to choose from anyone else from that list? I, I would like to go ahead and appoint the, and I can't pronounce her name right, Temeka Peoples. Okay. I'll second. Temeka Peoples, okay. Temeka Peoples. Uh, Say it right. Yeah. Moved and seconded. Any discussion? Let's vote. Okay, 5 0. Okay, so now there were openings for f two more. Um, at large, or two, actually two at large um, uh, members and then two associate term members. One. Why one? We just point five. Okay, so we have one more for at large. Would anyone like to make a nominee? Okay. D does anyone else want to? Okay, I'll make a nomination. Um, Louise, Louise Servins. I'd like to make a nomination for. Uh, Mr. Mayor, I'm sorry to interrupt, but sure. uh, Louis Servin is already on the board. I'm not sure. I he's, think on he what? Was, he's already on the board. Why is he on here then? Okay. Okay, then I will go with uh, is how about Gracella Howard Hernandez? Okay, I'd like to nominate Gracella Howard Hernandez. Need a second? Do we don't have a second? Second. Okay. Uh, any discussion? Let's vote. Okay, and that passes 5 0. Okay, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. We have six at large. Okay, now we need, still need two associate members. Uh, 
Anyone? Councilmember Homdahl. I, I nominate Jeanette Rodriguez. Jeanette Rodriguez, okay. Jeanette Rodriguez. I, I apologize. Uh, Luis Servin, his term did expire. He's continuing to serve and would be willing to. My apologies for the confusion. Okay, so say this again. Luis is not officially on the board. He's just continuing until uh, reappointed, if you wish to do so. Okay, so, um, okay, so, well, well, we can possibly put him as one of the associate members now because we've filled up all the. Yeah. Okay. So, Councilmember Humdahl has nominated. Who did you nominate? Jeanette, Jeanette Rodriguez. Do we have a second on Jeanette? Okay. Okay, so Jeanette Rodriguez is one. Do we have another one? Oh. Yes. Uh, last I heard, Janet did withdraw her application. Um, she had previously um, uh, been interested, but uh, has withdrawn. Okay. Well, let's um, let's go with Louise Servin as one alternate. And there's still uh, one more. We have. Um, nominate Shelley. Yeah, I'll go okay. ahead and. Well, I'll, I'll just go ahead. And Councilman Vega, did you have a nomination? Yeah, we got a guy named here that's uh, a man that I met once. Was his name was Brent Lauter. Yeah. Let's go ahead and. Uh, like okay, to, Brett. Yes, okay. I'd like to make a motion so, for that. I'll second it. Okay, so the nomination is for uh, Louise Servant and Brett Lauter as the two associate members. Any discussion? Let's vote. And that passes 5-0. Okay, I think we did that. Okay, good. No, it's, it's okay. Okay, next we have one opening on the Utility Commission. That's Council Member Homdahl's appointee. I would uh, like to nominate Ken Ryan to the job. I met with him. He's very much involved with the Utility Commission. It'd be good to have him there. Okay, I need a second. I'll second. Okay, any discussion? Let's vote. That passes 5-0. Councilman Vega, did you have a... I'm sorry. Okay, I'm sorry, okay, okay. And next we have Youth Commission. We have one term ending January of 17 and one term ending January of 18. We have two nominees. Would anyone like to make a recommendation? I'll nominate. Okay, which one would you like for the term ending 17 and which one for 18? I'll nominate both as listed. Okay, well, oh, I see, okay, okay, 17 and 18. Okay, so it's- and I'll um, second that. Okay, so 17 18. Okay, it's been moved and seconded. Any discussion? Now let's vote. And that passes 5-0. Dwayne. Okay, we're going to move on to council requests. This is item number six. Our request to uh, fund additional youth programs. Let's see, who is this? this is uh, Ms. Plummer. Good evening, Mayor, Council Members, audience uh, at home and, and here tonight, and staff. Tonight I'm here to talk about a request to fund additional youth programs and adoption of resolution number 6028, parenthesis 16. Um, what we're asking for tonight is that you accept the staff report and, and approve the additional programs and adopt the resolution authorizing certain youth programs uh, funding for the youth programs and um, to go back a little bit back in January when the council was looking at all the city fees and making the adoption of the city fees it was suggested that the recreation staff bring back to the council some suggestions on programs and events that would support positive youth activities and as you recall during that fee study it was recommended for the Recreation Division that a lot of our programs be cost recovered at certain percentages, and that's what you approved that evening. But prior to your approval, there was discussion from the public about possibly adding 
lowering some of those fees related to youth programs to allow more children access to youth services. So instead of adjusting the fees per se, the recommendation from the staff was that we maintain the cost recovery rate that was proposed and to bring back to you some suggestions for additional services. Um, after an evaluation of our current programs in a community that are offered by the city and offered by other organizations, your staff determined that there's a shortage of some free or reduced programs, some, a shortage of some scholarship opportunities and free family activities. So tonight I presented to you in the report some suggestions and our recommendations for services to be included this current fiscal year. Because we are in a two-year budget cycle, we're looking at these programs and events to be added to our current budget cycle, and that's the only time we'll come to you with this as if we wanna include these programs and services, next time we'll include it in our budget as we carry forward. So the first item was the addition of Movies in the Park. In the past, we've been able to have Movies in the Park in our community. The first time was brought to us by the um, county, Parks Dep Division, their nonprofit organization actually funded our opportunities for movies in the park, and that was the first time we brought it in Lompoc. Last year, we saw the return of that through a collaboration between us and the Theater Project Group. And then um, there, there's just not money for it, and it does get quite costly. The staff needs are just there to run a little bit of a snack bar or to help monitor the crowd, help keep the bathrooms clean, and, and just help answer any questions. The licensing costs, that's the, the opportunity to show the movie in our parks, and those fees range anywhere from $340 per show to $700 a show, depending on who owns that license. And the rental is for the equipment, and that's for the giant inflatable screen that we're looking at. So our proposal for Movies in the Park is to offer it three times this summer. We were originally looking at alternating Fridays starting on July 15th, but because of the dog show, we're gonna have to bump that by one, one, one week, but we will still offer it three times this summer, concluding before football begins here in Lompoc. The other program that we're asking for money for this year is the Summer Drop-In Playground Program. This is an eight-week program in the summer for children ranging between the ages of six and 12, offered in the afternoon hours at the Anderson Recreation Center. This is a program that's been long-standing in our community and has typically been funded by the Human Service Commission. Over the past number of years, the Human Service Commission has opted not to fund this program as their monies have um, drastically been reduced and their request for funding continues to rise. So again this year we've been denied, we applied again, we come back and knock on their door every year, but we were denied again this year for a recommendation for funding and so we're coming to you. We've offered this program on a fee-based opportunity and we saw our numbers significantly decrease. On an average when we were funded by the Human Service Commission we saw anywhere between 60 and 80 kids a day. When we went to a fee-based program, and our fee-based was very, very affordable because we were able to augment, and we offered at the, we were able to augment some funds, and we offered it at the Anderson Recreation Center, where I am housed, as well as a multitude of other staff. So we have support staff available in the case of any issues, and we saw our numbers drop to 22. So that's telling us that there's 40 to 60 kids every afternoon that need service that are either wandering the streets or they're locked in their house waiting for mom or dad to come home from work. The other opportunity with offering the summer drop-in playground program is that we collaborate with the Lompoc Unified School District and we're able to offer a free lunch program during those same eight weeks at the Anderson Recreation Center. That program is not just only open to our participants, but also open to the community at large as a feeding site in our community where families can come and children under the age of 19 can be fed lunch every day of the week during that time. The other program is the last time we spoke, back in January we talked about scholarships and the Recreation Division offers scholarships, but we do not advertise our scholarship program because we do not have a funding line item for it. So um, we do offer those and we request that the participant pay at least 50% of the registration fee for our scholarships and in our proposal tonight, we're asking for 50% of the scholarships in that 1,250 be attributed towards aquatics only, and the other 50% towards general recreation programs for youth. The last thing on our list that we're asking for tonight are free swim days for our community. 
while we feel that the access to the Lompoc Aquatic Center is very affordable to our residents and we have a multitude of programs for affordability, there are some kids that just don't go because there is a fee attached to going. We see free swim days as um, an option in a lot of communities, including our neighboring communities, that they, they'll open up their pools. These are sometimes sponsored, but to recover the cost that we need to recover, it would be a significant challenge for us to find sponsorship to cover that outside of, of coming to the city to, to recover it. The f money that you see there in the budgetary need for the sponsorship of those four days, we're proposing two in the summer, one in the fall near our 10 year anniversary celebration, the Aquatic Center, and then one again next spring. The, that money is just to recoup the cost of the revenues that would be lost during that day and to add additional funding for some additional staff that we're anticipating we would need that day. The fiscal impact, well, I don't have the money, but I do have some good news. The movies in the park program and the free swim days would fall under the same description that you have in your approved line item of community event support. In working with our fiscal manager, there are monies that will have been approved that will not be used this year because we will not have the criterium event this year in 2016. So it's recommended that the money for the free swim days and the movies in the park be reallocated from the community event support to recover those costs. The summer drop-in money and the scholarship money would have to come from general fund support. And the total of those two programs is $13,033. So with that, uh, in our efforts to provide support to low-income families and to strengthen the family union in Lompoc, the Lompoc Recreation Division has presented a multitude of opportunities for your consideration. And I'm available if you have any questions. Ms. Blummer, on the free swim days, $8,000. So if these kids could not normally afford to swim. They're not gonna be there, they're not gonna pay. I can understand maybe some of the money for maybe some additional staff during that time, but if the kids were not gonna be there because they couldn't afford, why are we losing any revenue if they weren't gonna be there to begin with? Because those kids wouldn't be coming. It would be the kids that could afford to come. So typically on a Saturday in the summer, we will get between um, in July last year, just for an example, there were only three days where we didn't reach the $2,000 mark for a Saturday and Sunday in July. So we had record-breaking numbers. We're seeing a, an average of $2,000 coming in in revenues in a day. That's not counting the people that have our Splash Pass, which is technically at the door free because they're paying monthly. Um, that's not counting anybody that's coming with a free pass. That's counting just admissions at the door. So by opening up free days, typically what we've seen in other communities is on those free days, your average person that comes to the pool on a regular basis chooses not to come that day because the anticipation of the facility being extremely crowded. Does that answer your question? Yeah, it, yes, except if it's always at capacity, you're saying that the pool is always at capacity during the... Those... I'm saying during the summer months, we're, we're very, very busy. Um, so in looking at that, there will be a loss of revenue because if we're opening it up free, then anybody can come swim at no charge. We're losing all that revenue. In addition, because we would anticipate we're going to be at capacity, then we would bring in additional staff to help supervise because the other concern that we may see to be honest with you, when you do have free swim days, is you have a lot of kids that don't have a lot of access to the water, so we have, we up the lifeguarding because we're gonna see a lot of non-swimmers coming out. And I can understand that. City Manager. I was just going to clarify, it's a loss of, of income that we otherwise would have had that day. The difference is whether you are giving free, you opening up the doors for free, which is what's being proposed for everyone that might come, as opposed to giving free passes to people you go through some process to identify their particular need and that's the difference. Okay. Councilmember Starbuck. Why do we have to do it in the summer? Why don't we do it when we're not at max capacity so that we don't lose that revenue? We could. We could offer it at any time. We're proposing twice during the summertime because we always associate swimming with summertime. We could do it at, at our, our non heavily impacted times, that, that time's up to you if you would like that direction. We definitely would like to do one near our 10-year our anniversary celebration, which would be in October, 
um, but we would like to we would like to be able to just offer this for our families in Lompoc. Any other comments from the council? Okay, um, you know, I'm Councilmember Mosby. Yeah, you tried to qualify CBDG money on this? Is that what you're saying? The human service funds, correct, for the summer drop in playground program only. Only for that one? That was the only one that you felt would potentially qualify? Yes. And denied. Have you ever been ex approved for that? Yes. When when monies were great, we actually had enough funding to offer four different sites throughout Lompoc through human service funds. But over the years, as you know, the amount of income coming in for human service distribution has decreased. The amount of request has increased. And um, the commission just felt that it there was not enough justification to align with their priorities. Because I understand the funds are up, maybe not for their por portion of it, but some of the funds are there. So, well, I'll look into that for next year. Thank you. Okay, so correct me if I'm wrong, but you're saying that their money is money is available in the Parks and Recreation approved budget for movies in the park and the which other program? No, monies are not currently approved in our budget for any of these programs. What is approved in the current budget in the community events support where you uh, supported Flower Festival, the Criterium, the Christmas Parade, and a multitude of other events, because the Criterium is not taking place, those monies are budgeted and not being used. So the recommendation is to reallocate those funds to cover some of the costs for the movies in the park and the free swim days. Okay, so the Criterium money could cover Moving the park and free swim days. Yes. And there would be, and th if we approve that, there would be no additional money coming out of the general fund. If that's all you're approving, yes. Well, I, I realize that. Okay. Yes. Okay. So, any other council comments or concerns? Okay. Well, we can make a second motion if someone would like to, but I'd like to make make the motion to use the criterion. I'm sorry. Oh, public comment. We're going to make public comment. Yeah. Thank you. Public comment. Mayor, City Council members, Nicholas Gonzalez, resident of Lompoc. I believe I was one of the individuals that came up in the last meeting and petitioned you to uh, go ahead and provide more activities for the youth. I know all of you have always made it a large campaign uh, issue in the past and I'm just here to encourage you to go ahead and do that. I firmly believe it the more that we engage the youth in activities um, and a lot of our youth unfortunately are economically challenged that the the fewer crimes and other act, unwanted behaviors are, are the direct result of keeping them busy in productive activities. So again I'll encourage you to um, go ahead and approve this and provide more services to those unfortunate residents or those that are less capable of, of having these services. Thank you. Okay, anyone else? Okay, seeing no one rise, we're gonna close public comment. Okay, <coughs> now, uh, Councilmember Hamdahl, did you have something? Go ahead, yeah, we'll finish okay. what you were saying. So, as I'm saying, you know, we can make several motions on this, but the motion I'm gonna make is that um, I'd like to use the criterion money that was going to be used for the criterion will not be used to cover the movies in the park and the free swim days. So that'd be second, my motion. Yeah. I'll second that, that's what I was gonna do. Okay, any discussion? Councilmember Starbuck. If, what was the total amount allocated for the criterion, John? I mean, obviously, it was uh, almost thirteen thousand dollars there. I believe that it it actually was more than thirteen thousand dollars because of the fact that it was all city staff that were attributed to the event, as well as our five thousand dollar cash contribution. So I don't recall. I don't recall the exact number, but the um, the two amounts that are on here are less than what isn't being spent. I just don't remember exactly the dollar amount. Yeah, I, I guess my point here is in the discussion, rather than just approve the two events, we, we could almost approve everything you've asked for here with very little augmentation 
out of the general fund based upon what we've already put aside for the criterion. Mr. Wilkie. I'm going to defer to the man. What that would require is a budget adjustment from the line item that is for the contributions to probably a line item within the recreation, which was not something we proposed, but we, we could do that. Staff cannot do a budget adjustment between programs, but you obviously have that ability to be able to move it from the non-departmental, which is where the contributions are, into recreation. See, I think, I don't want to put words in your mouth, Councilmember Starbuck, but I think what Councilmember Starbuck is saying and what I'm saying is that we would like to approve as many as possible, but we do not really want to dip into any more general fund for this. Am I paraphrasing that correct, Councilmember Starbuck? Yes. Okay. Um, so I'll tell you what, we have a motion and a second for these two. We can come back and discuss the rest of the programs, but um, Councilmember Hummel, Hummel, would you? I would like to, before we vote on it, to total move the money, I'd like to see what money we do have and, and where, what it's going to do and what its effect's going to be. Uh, I don't have any the problem doing that, but it looks like we don't know exactly what we do have to use this year, because next year is going to be a whole new ball game. And one reason why, uh, thanks to Governor Brown, and he going to go up to $15 an hour for that. So that's going to be taken against some of the people we have working in the uh, pool and other places that live that. So that rate's going to be going up over the next three, four years. So I, I, I'd rather see this, look at this, and have exactly what's going to be coming out if we use the same facility this coming year, then we'll have to look at the future. If I may, the criterion money that we're talking about is for two years. It's for the 15-17 cycle. So neither one of those two years are being used. The proposed programs that we're talking about here are only for 16-17. Is that they, wait, they won't be in, started until July or close to July. So you'll have two years of funding that's being left on the table and just one year of funding for the programs that are in recreation that are being proposed. But I think what we all want to know is how, how many of how these... How much is in there, yes. I'm sorry? Uh, I can go, I can find that. I can find that. Okay. It wouldn't be hard to get. Okay. Yeah. Um, Councilmember Vega. Um, just for clarification, which two are we exactly talking about right now? Uh, we're looking at the movies in the park and the free swim. That was the motion and the second. That's a discussion we're on right now. Okay. You know, personally, I think that uh, use of funds, you know, to subsidize a free swim day would probably be the, my least uh, favorite choice on this list, you know, for the, for the impact that we're going to get. So I wanted to make that comment. Mm -hmm. okay? okay. I don't think that that's probably absolutely necessary. In a, in a budgetary aspect uh, that we're looking at right now um, as far as finance. And the scholarships is, is, a, is a great uh, great thing also. But again, I think more impact would be if you're gonna in, invite families to movies in the park and having the summer drop-in availability, I think that would be a better, a better way to go as far as, those are my comments, Bob, okay? Okay. Okay, so. Mr. Mayor, Mr. Yes. Wilkie went to um, go retrieve that information. Councilmember Mosby. How many people are affected with the free swim days, approximately? As far as how many people could we accommodate? Yeah, how many people do you think are going to make it? What is your max load for the, the day, the free day? What, how many people come in and out using the free swim day? We've never had a free swim day except for the first day that we opened. And we were at capacity. Actually, we exceeded capacity with permission from the fire department on that day, which is what we would um, know we had permission. There are, uh, there are certain things that we can do requesting it ahead of time and having taking additional safety precautions, um, which we would work with the fire department again. Typically, we would see anywhere between four and 600 people. And, and that's during the whole day because you have people coming and going, right? It's, so. in, it's within a, the recreation swim time frame, which is typically a one to three. 
four to six hundred for one to three. Yes. So if you had potentially four, you're somewhere between sixteen hundred and twenty four hundred for four days. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Well. Mr. City Attorney, how can we go on to the next item? Can we just... Um... Um, well, I'll tell you what. Why don't... I'm going to suggest... I'm going to suggest you, uh, Councilmember Humdahl, withdraw his second. My motion will fail for a second. That's not going to do anything because we're going to still come back to this item, so... <laughs> Let's take a 10 minute break. <laughs> okay.
anything but $2,500. Oh, so you only, you only have to take $2,500 With the microphone, we're going to reconvene this meeting. Mr. Wilkie, what's the good news? Mayor, council members, it's loud. The criterion, the dollar amount that's in the contributions amount for the criterion for the two years is $23,087. And if we add the program for the meals and the scholarships, for 1617, uh, we would need to use $2,536 of the CAS promotion amount that's in Teresa's um, economic development fund, and then all of them would be covered by budget adjustments. And she suggested that's okay. So we would have to make a amendment to the resolution, which would replace use of general fund reserves for the after school program with the going to um, it would come from 10 957501 that's the account number rather than from general fund fund balance and then there would be an additional amount that would have to be budget adjustment from 10 590 program, which is economic development, account 53482 in the amount of 2,536. Okay, so it, just, it, yeah, Councilman just a quick question now. Now the criterion is not on for 16, but what about 17? Uh, no, it looks like it's a no. <laughs> <laughs> so the criterion is a done event? I, I'm anticipating it's going to be a non-event for 17 as well. Okay. So the general fund contribution and basically out of the economic development is $2,536. We would be able to fund all four of these programs for two years. Correct. If we revise the resolution to include those two accounts rather than fund balance, yes. Okay. Um, at this time, then, I'd like to make an amended motion that we go ahead and, and fund all four programs for the 15-16 cycle, then. And amend the resolution as... And amend the resolution also. Thank you. Okay, I'll second that. And the amended motion will be heard before mine. If it passes, it will nullify that. So, so it's been moved and seconded. Any discussion? Let's vote. And that passes 5-0. Mr. Mayor, actually, technically, that was a motion to amend the other motion. Now that's a main motion. Now you have to vote on the main motion. Okay, so let's vote on the... Well, main motion, motion, okay. So now we have to vote on the first one. No, you have to vote on the amended motion. The amended, okay. Let's vote on the amended motion. That's 5 0. Okay, thank you. Okay. Thank you for giving me that time to go look up those numbers. Okay, let's go on to item number seven. Mr. Wilkie, you can come back up. Council members, uh, Mayor, I actually don't have it in front of me because it was really an item that was requested to have a discussion at, by the council. So what I was really basically doing is teeing up the resolution that was requested at a prior council meeting for you at that discussion. And um, I think that's about all I have. All, my part of it is in that. So. Okay. 
Uh, bring it back to council. Any questions, comments? Mr. Mosby. Yeah, I brought this up first to look at. I mean, we've we've uh, we're doing some processing without really. But this would be in mind, and with the fire station, with regard to this fire station, I thought it was a good idea that we look at it. Maybe there are some adjustments that we might want to do with this uh, emergency money, whether it gets isolated or maybe there should be, a, as an idea, maybe there should be money added to this. this is back from 94 that $2 million was set aside, and maybe that's not enough. Maybe we need a CPI on it, a COLA or something that, that we add on to it. Maybe... Um, more isolation in it or combined in, in has the potentialities of, well, I guess in order to touch it, I believe it has to be voted on council to use any of it anyways currently. So I just thought it'd be a good idea that we open up for discussion. It was, what, 22 years ago that this was pushed through, so maybe there's some changes as other people want to put. Okay. Um, any other council members wants to say anything? Okay, let's open this up for public comment. Council members, Mayor, John Lynn, um, I think the first most important thing is that we recognize that this needs to be held as a separate line item in our budget, and that amendment needs to be passed by the council so the budget reflects this as a separate item. Number two, and I've spoken about this in the past, um, there was a great deal of forethought on behalf of the council when this was put in place, but we really haven't done justice to it since then. Interest income from this has been put into the general fund, and at very minimum, any interest income from this should, should accrue to the account. And yeah, probably we need to start working on COLA because what was $2 million then is probably 1.4 today. So I would urge the council to discuss that. And number one, put any interest that's earned into the account. Number two, in the next budget cycle, establish a method by which the COLA is built into it. And obviously, as staff has reported, get it back to an individual line item. Thank you. Anyone else from public? Okay, we're gonna close public comment, bring it back to the council. So what's the desire of the council? Councilman Starbuck. Yeah. Mr. Wilkie, this currently isn't shown as a single line item then anywhere in the budget, but is it shown in our actual reserves as part of what um, Mr. Albro manages for investment? The actual, <clears throat> the account that holds the $2 million is a restricted cash account. That restricted cash account has existed since 1994. In 2008 or so, GASB 54 was published for GASB um, Governmental Accounting Standards Board published pronouncement number 54, which looks at um, the general fund in context of function rather than names. So we passed a general uh, GASB 54 resolution in 2011, which was on the city's website. In that resolution, we looked at special revenue funds that were, had been set up for various reasons, looking at those to see if in form and function they're part of the, they are general in nature. Um, so, and that was done by GASB in order to better show on financial statements nationwide uh, a more comparable reporting method. Um, at that point in time, reserves such as our economic uncertainty reserve uh, was specifically identified, and GASB 54 also provides for um, various categories of fund balance. And fund balance for, from the point of view of reporting is the more uh, appropriate way of looking at reserves. Um, if you have cash on hand and you have an obligation on July 1st equal to or greater than a cash amount, then you really don't have unrestricted reserves at June 30th. And so 
looking at the fund balance and the equity is really more of a indication of the economic health of a of a fund. And one of the things that was done in 2011 was a, an evaluation of other um, special revenue funds, such as the Economic Uncertainty Fund, uh, the COPS grant funds, some other um, specific amount accounts that we're using to um, segregate out revenue streams, but are act in actuality general fund in nature. We actually have a separate fund for our TOT collections. TOT is obviously a general fund type of revenue, but we keep it se separate for ease of reporting and ease of managing that fund. The amount that's in the $2 million, the $2 million that's in a restricted cash account in the general fund is restricted. It, it's not, we're not adding, we're not using it for operation. The general fund operating account is separate from this. So um, I see that this is already in a separate designated category for the, the purposes that was put into place in 1994. The, if you want to further designate various amounts that's in your fund balance of the general fund, there are five different categories that you can do, and it, this is summarized in GASB 54 in our resolution that implemented it for us, and I'll just go through a couple of them. Um, one is a designation of non-spendable reserves. Um, the typical thing that's in this is inventory. Once you have inventory on hand, it's an asset, but you can't spend that asset. You, you've already spent the money to buy that inventory. So that's in a non-spendable category. Restricted funds um, are restricted by covenants or external legislation um, or the use of that activity. The library is actually categorized as part of the general fund for the purposes of reporting to in our financial statements. On our books for segregation, and because it was a separate entity up until this budget cycle, the two or three parts of the library have always been reported separately, and they, they continue to be reported separately on our books. But for the general fund reporting purposes at the end of the year, it's included in the general fund as any other general fund activities, parks, public safety, recreation. But however, the reserves that are held by the library are for library purposes. So th those are restricted for the purposes of the library. And in our financial statements, there's a line item that says restricted library operations, their fund balances in that line item. Um, there are two other categories that we do not currently use, committed fund balance and assigned fund balance. In the GASB 54 resolution we adopted in 2011, the assigned fund balance category, which earmarks amounts for intended uses, was delegated to the city administrator, then now the city manager. The committed fund balance is something that's within the purview of the city council to limit the use of resources to a specific activity. Um, in the GASB 54 pronouncement, it talks about what fits in that committed fund balance amount. And unfortunately, the, the existing wording for our uncertainty fund is not certain enough to be able to be in the committed fund balance category. However, the council at any point in time has the ability to do a commitment of funds that would show up on our financial statements at the end of the year for those type of specific activities. And it could be anything you want. It could be restri restricted for future replacement of City Hall. It could be restricted for, um, it's limitless what you can do. Um, and then the last category is anything else, which is basically unassigned fund balance, which is where the majority of our reporting for the general fund and general fund-like activities are reported on our financial statements. So uh, that just gives you a little bit of a background on our GASB 54, which takes into account 
some reserve policies that were in existence. Having a cash reserve is a good thing, and it's good that we have that um, fund. Uh, but if you have obligations that supersede that cash amount, having that reserve uh, doesn't really do what it needs to do. Because if, I, I guess an example is if we have something that happens that causes the general fund to have negative cash, we wouldn't be, we still wouldn't be touching this $2 million, but the general fund overall would have less than $2 million in it. And that's something that would have to come, but it may have adequate unassigned fund balances where it's just perfectly fine. So one of the things I see is that if we do any kind of modifications to this, we bring it up to the more current wording of unassigned fund balance rather than a cash reserve because cash is, having cash is great, but you have to actually have cash that's un, unrestricted from uh, other obligations. And that not, that's not talked about in the resolution at all. So I don't know if that helped any, but. Yeah, I. Fairly clear, so. Can we go to public, can we go to public <laughs> comment? <laughs> We've had public comment? Yeah. Okay. I got one. Hmm. Councilmember Homdahl. Yeah, Brad, as you go back through and you're talking about the uh, $2 million transferred economic uncertainty is number one and all, all the transfers, we're talking about $2 million. Does that $2 million ever accumulate any interest on it? And where does that interest <coughs> go to? It doesn't say with the $2 million, so it's kind of what it's. Well, the, the resolution, I believe, is silent on that aspect. So when I got here, any interest earnings on that cash, because it's pooled with everything else that's part of the city for investment purposes, um, each and every budget cycle, that amount that was estimated, uh, the actual amount that was actually earned was immediately transferred to the general fund for use in the general fund. So there was no, there was no designation in the, in the resolution to accumulate that, to add to that reserve amount. Councilor Mosby, do you have anything else to say on this? I think it sounds like it's pretty well protected right now. I've only ever found one instance in the in the budget process where I've seen where the a budget resolution requested to borrow funds from that fund uh, since the inception of it in 1994. I, I didn't go through every single budget, but I came across one where it, the budget requested to use 500,000. It ended up not having to use it, so it didn't. But that budget resolution provided for that authority to borrow 500,000 in that budget cycle. And that was, I think, in, I want to say, very early 2000s, late 1999s, so. And maybe one thing, again, for discussion as well is, is the interest that comes off that, maybe it could, Stand to have to bump that up each year because, you know, again, $2 million in 94 is a big difference than $2 million now. So maybe yeah. something for discussion with the other council members if maybe we could uh, think about that, that we, the interest stays in the account and, and builds upon that. Um, yeah, and the budget cycle for 17 19 is just around the corner. So if that's a uh, policy decision that the council wants us to follow, we will do that. It wouldn't be, it would be, I would recommend if we did that to modify the resolution to incorporate that aspect so it's part of the resolution and, and maybe look at it from the point of view of more modern Gatsby pronouncements as opposed to what was done. It was great that what we did in 1994, but new pronouncements of how you report things have kind of uh, superseded how that is viewed, so. Thank you. Maybe bring it back at that time in. City Manager. 
Thank you, Mayor, if I might. The, um, my contribution of thought to this is if you have a different amount you'd like to consider for this fund, to go ahead and name that, as opposed to taking approaches that seek to compute and divide interest calculations, there's, there's, a, there's actually a lot of labor and then propensity for error when we get into these sort of internal um, interest calculations. And since whatever you decide is this policy is a self-regulating thing, in other words, you, you as a council are deciding what um, the city will, um, will set aside for this contingency, I, I think it's a lot easier and straightforward if you just identify what that amount is. And if you think it should be higher than two million to name that, we can certainly bring back what the C, if you're comfortable with two million and 1994 dollars and whatever that is today, so if that's three million or four million, we can certainly calculate that and bring that forward. But when you start talking about uh, calculating and accumulating interest, your, your decision in this only, only binds the city as long as you're this council. The next council can decide to change the amount or uh, eliminate it uh, by resolution. So um, I just think it's a lot more straightforward. If you have a, a certain amount you want to you wanna identify, uh, it'll, it'll simplify matters, I, I think, if you just identify that amount. Okay, and would you suggest that we do that at the next budget cycle? No, actually, if it was my suggestion, my suggestion would be to not have this. Um, but if you're going to have one, uh, you can certainly do it um, whenever, whenever you're uh, wishing to do it. So if you'd like us to bring back before, I, I'd say the next budget cycle makes sense because it's a little late in the game to increase it now where we've already built current budgets based upon only setting that money aside and not a greater amount. So definitely I wouldn't do it any sooner than the next budget cycle. Councilor Mosby, would you be okay with bringing back the next budget cycle? Okay. Yes. We did a public comment on this, is that correct? Yeah. Okay, good, okay. So there was no action that needed on this. We're gonna move on to item number eight. Under new business, Thompson Park Ball Field Renovation. And that is uh, Ms. Gallivan. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, members of council, Teresa Gallivan, Economic Development Director, Assistant City Manager. In December, uh, December 15, 2015, this council approved the Thompson Ball Park ball field renovation project that was brought forward by a group of volunteers made up of LGSA, Lompoc Parks and Recreation Men's League and Granite Construction and members of that volunteer group are here this evening if you'd just be acknowledged, thank you. Um, with the approval of that project, the council also approved appropriations of $209,648 uh, the city's commitment in this process is to furnish the supplies, um, the permit, the volunteer group will bring forward volunteer labor, and the MOU you asked us to bring back, we have outlined in the MOU the division of duties and roles of both the city and the volunteer group, um, and bring that forward for your approval to have the city manager execute that. The group has already agreed to all the terms within the MOU and uh, follows many of our other volunteer park project uh, MOUs. Any questions for Ms. Gallivan? Councilman Mosby. The city had filed for some grant funding. Is that still on its way? Is it? Good question. Yes, the city did apply for grant funding and um, we should hear in May whether or not we may get some grant funding, uh, about $167,000. So if that does come forward, we would not need to use all the impact fees that you've already appropriated and they could be put towards other park projects. Okay, thank you. Councilman Mose. Yeah. Councilman right. Homdahl. No, I'm real pleased to see this happen because Thompson Park needs it. Look at what everybody's going to be doing, but it also puts the public involved with the city, putting a park together that the kids use and everybody else. So I think it's an excellent.
program, and so I don't know if we need to do anything more, but I'd move to the comment. Oh, I'm sorry. Let the public comment. Okay, anything else from the council? Okay, any from open public comment on this issue? Any from the public? Uh, Mike Mendebles, I'm the president of the LGSA, the Longpole Girls Softball Association. Um, I started uh, just coaching and realized that um, our fields are in desperate need of renovation. Uh, they're unsafe, number one. But number two, our league has taken upon a change in culture. Um, we, we did our draft this year, so the teams are a lot more even. The games are a lot more exciting. We have a bigger crowds. Uh, the neighborhoods are coming in. It's not just the parents and the players and the families. We have just uh, the neighborhood people coming in to watch the games because they're exciting and it's a, it's a great venue. Um, with the changes that we've made, uh, they've helped the league you know, uh, be more competitive and the girls happier to play. I think this project, um, the girls seeing the new field would bring more excitement to the to the community and the involvement. You know, we're getting so many volunteers from church groups and our parents that I think this is just would be a great thing for the community. Uh, as it is, we are having a, our first tournament in Lompoc this summer uh, in probably a decade. Uh, that's going to bring. I have a request from the. ASA to get a hotel to suit 60 uh, rooms and five suites. So it's already going to bring money into the community. It's going to pay for itself in the long run. Uh, that's all I got. Thank you. Thank you very much. Nicholas Gonzalez, resident of Lompoc, Mayor, uh, Councilman. Uh, many moons ago, several uh, community members and I got together and we tried to do our own prior to the economic development committee and all the other things formulated, kind of do an impact study. And we went around to the local delis and hotels and we took the receipts that we had spent when we went to other communities on our softball tournaments. And we were very much surprised to see that it was several hundred thousand dollars a weekend when a tournament would be sponsored and people would come in from the community because they were staying in the hotels, they were eating at the restaurants, they were buying gasoline. So I think I'd like to commend you for making this step and starting to improve our recreation facilities because I think recreation is a significant uh, potential uh, win for the city on economic development. So please continue in this direction. I think it's very helpful. And it also addresses the other need, which is the kids. Thank you. Hi, my name is Larry Barbosa. I'm with Lompoc Girls Softball Association. Um, I've been working with this project with Mario and the city since around July, August. Um, been working with the professional volunteers that we've secured, um, making sure that we have every aspect of the project being managed by a, a local professional business. So that's not just people off the street. Um, this is going to bring a lot of people together. We got men's league softballs excited about this project because it will be a, a ball field designed for them also, not just the girls. Um, it'll bring tournaments into town, like he said, with more revenue. And I think it's a good project. Hope you, you'll pass it, please. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Anyone else? Seeing no one rise, we're gonna bring it back to the council. Councilman Starbuck. Yeah, I'd like to say that, you know, we've seen it work through the Little League and the, the happiness of the kids going out onto a new field. Yes, you're right, the economic impacts. Will we recoup the money over a period? Absolutely. So I'd like to move that we go ahead and uh, approve the MOU with I'll the Lompoc Girls it. Softball. I'll second it. It's been Everybody's moved saying. and seconded. Any discussion? Councilman Vega, do you have a discussion? Mr. Humdall, no, the only discussion is I'm glad to see it happening. Now we need to do the same thing with Ryan Park. We got to put that together because each each one of these parks does bring in people, and it works. So I think that's 
the, the next goal will work for Ryan Park. Okay, any other discussion? Let's vote. That passes 5 0. And thank you, gentlemen. Okay, we're going to move on to item number nine. Let's see, Ms. Segovia. It's approval of a memorandum of, un of understanding to implement the Sustainable <laughs> Underground Management Act. Honorable Mayor, members of the council, ladies and gentlemen, um, I'm here to present a report on consideration for approval of a draft memorandum of understanding to implement sustainable groundwater management act. In 2014, the state of California adopted the sustainable groundwater management act in the water code. It's mandated throughout the state. Department of Water Resources list groundwater basins and included in that list is the Santa Ynez River Valley Basin and Lompoc, the Lompoc Plain is a sub-basin there. So we are included as um, you'll see below a medium priority basin. So we're not, our, I wanna emphasize that the Lompoc Plain is in good shape. Um, since we're part of that medium priority basin, we have to comply. Uh, the biggest thing is that the Sustainable Groundwater Management Act requires basins to develop a groundwater sustainable agency by June 30th, 2017 and adopt a groundwater sustainable plan by January 31st, 2020. This map is not quite as clear, but if you take a look at it, you can see the Lompoc Plain, and um, if you take a look at your MOU, uh, you'll see that if it's to, later on, um, if we do determine that there are three sub-basins, we would be in the western portion. City staff and the city's legal firm, SOMAC Water Firm, so Max Simmons and Dunn reviewed the MOU and um, for cooperation and city staff does support city participation in it. This, um, I'm sure the council's aware as well as the citizen that the city's sole source of water is groundwater from the Lompoc Plain. And again, we're part of that San Inez River Valley Basin and we're subject to the to the Sigma. The one thing that I want to point out is um, Lompoc is in a good position as we're going into this legislation. We've done quite a bit of monitoring through the USGS. We've had uh, monitoring contracts for a long time. And we've also done in 2013, you approved a groundwater management plan. And the Sigma is putting the burden on public agencies such as cities and other water agencies to develop the groundwater sustainable plans. The San Inez River Water Conservation District, it's a local agency, it includes about 180,000 acres and that does include most of the San Inez River Valley Basin. They don't manage the basin, but they've monitored it. Um, they do work with us with one of the monitoring contracts. And they've done this since they were formed in 1939. They also contract with Stetson Engineers to prepare an engineering and survey report that discusses the water supply conditions. And the San Inez River Water Conservation District, we feel, as well as the other agencies, that they should serve as the sole the primary um, groundwater sustainability agency and prepare a plan in conjunction with the agencies. The San Inez River Water Conservation General Manager has reviewed all the requirements, very familiar with it, and the attached MOU to your report was reviewed with their legal counsel as well as, as, well as ours. The MOU provides for 
again, this is a draft MOU, and it does provide for possible approaches to meet the Groundwater Sustainability Act requirement. And as you take a look at it, again, um, there could be one groundwater sustainability agency for all of the eight agencies included, or there's three management areas within um, the whole contract proposed, and either option may prevail. And the draft MOU just provides an agreement so that the agencies can formally cooperate and they can begin discussing the implementation of the requirements. And they can also meet the June 30th, 2017 deadline to establish a groundwater sustainability agency. And this whole act is going to require quite a bit of staff time over the next three to five years. And the proposed draft MOU will not have a fiscal impact at this time. We don't know the cost. Again, this is just a starting point to discuss it. The costs related to the whole Management Act aren't known yet. They'll depend on the number, the configuration, and the complexity of the Act as well as the plan within the Basin. And by becoming a member of the proposed MOU, the city's overall cost should be reduced by joining other interested parties in the San Inez Valley groundwater basin. And in conclusion, the draft MOU for the Sigma implementation provides a reasonable organization and a cost-sharing approach to begin discussing the requirements for the San Inez River groundwater basin. Staff recommends that the council approve the attached draft memorandum of understanding for implementation of the Sustainable Groundwater Management Act in the San Inez River Valley Groundwater Basin and also authorize the city manager to sign the final MOU provided there are no substantive changes after review by the city attorney. I'm available for any questions. Mr. Starbuck. You know, you had mentioned that there should be no additional cost or it would be cheaper for us to go in with everybody else, which should be cheaper. But on the other hand, we've already done a groundwater management plan. We've already got conservation efforts. Wouldn't it, what if we were to just be a standalone agency on this? We did take a look at that. We don't think that's in our best interest. There's still quite a bit that we need to do. Um, I, I want to emphasize one thing. There are no costs with the draft MOU. When we do have the final MOU, that we will incur costs. So we do think at that point that it's going to be a lot more efficient to join other agencies. And again, um, if, if it is decided that we'll be part of one of the sub-basins, our sub-basin is in good shape. Councilman Mosby. From what I understand, for the next several years, you're going to be dedicating a good percentage of your time, should this MOU be signed and going through this process, right? There will be a lot of time. Um, and that's what scares me the most is the fiscal impact when we have, uh, we're moving forward with something we don't really have any idea. Are we looking at hundreds of thousands of dollars or what are we anticipating this to cost? I don't think we're looking at hundreds of thousands of dollars. The one thing that I want to mention with this draft MOU is, again, it's a draft MOU. It's a starting point to talk. If for some reason we decide as we're part of that discussion that this is not the best option, uh, we can remove ourselves with 30 days notice. What, what do you think, I mean, I mean, ballpark-ish? I wouldn't even begin to do that. I have no idea. That's the scary I, part when you enter into a blank check type of a agreement. I don't know, you know. But again, I can tell you one thing. Um, you, do have, you do have a groundwater plan. Uh, we do have a basin. Our sub-basin is in good shape. We would have to do this. I think it's going to be a lot more costly if we do this on our own. Councilman Humdahl. Yeah, I just, uh, one thing, it's, it is interesting, I look at all the different basins, the one thing we do know, Mission Hills, 
is got is in a completely different basin than what Lompoc Valley is because also their water comes from another area because their water quality when you run it through is it was was run about 500 parts per million or maybe less undissolved solids like Lompoc is around 2200 so in in the, in the valley Mission, Mission Hills is where they're at so it doesn't come down into the valley You're, it's all part of the diff now is Mission Hills are they tied in with this if we actually do vote on subregions, they would be part of our subregion because you're talking about, and I'll go back to the map. That subregion would include the Lompoc Plain, the Lompoc Upland, the Lompoc Terrace, um, the Santa Rita Upland, and so it would, it would include three areas. And again, um, they are in good shape. They are part of the Lompoc groundwater subbasin. But again, as we, as we discuss this MOU, there will be a decision whether we're talking about one agreement for all of the eight agencies or the three subregions. I think we're in good shape, and I can't predict which way this will go, but we are in we are in good shape. Okay. Anything else? Thank you, Susan. Um, public comment. Any from the public wish to comment on this? Seeing no one rise, we're going to bring it back to the council. I'd move staff recommendation. We have it a second. I'll say it. I'll say it. Okay, we have a motion a second. Any discussion? Let's vote. That passes 5 0. Thank you, Mr. Segovia. Okay, we're going to move on to item number 10, which is uh, City Council consideration of an action regarding a request to process application for annexation. Good evening, Mr. Mayor, council members. Uh, as the mayor indicated, this is a consideration of an action for the council to look at this uh, action. The act, only action being taken tonight is whether you're going to direct staff to process uh, this annexation request. And we're recommending that the council direct staff to begin processing the requested annexation, general plan amendment and zone change, and to um, review the application and determine the level of environmental review to direct the planning commission to hold a workshop to present the project to the community and to direct the planning commission to prepare a recommendation to the city council on the requested actions including consideration of annexation of the entire bailey avenue corridor the um, staff report contains background of the bailey avenue corridor this has been in discussion before the city for a number of years, it was part of our 2030 general plan. It was an expansion area within the plan, was studied and discussed at numerous hearings before both the Planning Commission and the City Council. Ultimately, the decision was that that Bailey Avenue corridor would remain within the urban limit line of the city and would remain with the land use designations that were in the 1997 general plan. Those were low density and very low density designations. Uh, in December, the city received a request from two property owners, and that is the property owner as shown in your map um, on the northern end of the Bailey Avenue corridor, just south of the Seabreeze project, and on the southern end of the Bailey Avenue corridor, which is just uh, between Ocean and Olive. The applicants are requesting the council look at their properties and um, direct staff to prepare an annexation request. 
the annexation request would be from the city. The city would be the applicant, and it would be going to the LAFCO. Um, that being said, we, looking at the project, we're asking council if you want staff to spend time processing this request. We have received it, but we really have not processed anything. We have no land use authority over the area, and we would have to analyze the fiscal report that came in. We would have to determine through CEQA if there was any additional uh, environmental review that needed to be done in order to process the annexation request. So there is work for staff to do with this project and we would recommend that it go to the Planning Commission which uh, is the commission that handles your land use matters. Those um, issues would be discussed at public hearings and recommenda recommendations would then come forward to the council for the final determination. Um, we did receive correspondence, which what the council received um, from the applicant representative, Mr. Fig, uh, regarding their response to the staff um, report that was on the um, that was distributed to council. That information was uh, placed on the website, and there were copies available for the public. Um, so that is basically my staff report, and I'm available for any questions. Any questions for Ms. Breeze? Okay, we'll open it up to the public. Thank you. Uh, my name is Terry Hammonds. Good evening, Council. Uh, I would like to request that um, we hear some discussion by the Council before you open this up to the public. I think it's important that we know what the Council's considering here before we move into the public's part of this. The, this is a very complex issue. It involves land that is not within the city. It conflicts with um, your general plan. It conflict, conflicts with the county's general plan. And it has to do with um, maybe interfering with some of these uh, owners that are out there on the west side that do not want to be part of this. So may I make the request that you open this up after your deliberation or discussion in the beginning, then you can make your decision after that. Thank you. Next. Yes, uh, Mr. Mayor and Council, uh, I'm Tom Figg. I'm a planning and uh, land use consultant. I'm representing the applicant in this matter. Uh, the two owners involved at the, both the north and the south end of the annexation area are here present this evening. Uh, Mark Anati for the property to the north and uh, Jack uh, Bodger for the property to the south. Uh, this has been in the works for some time now. Uh, I want to thank uh, Lucille for her guidance. Uh, she's been very helpful. Uh, we started this uh, effort about a year, year and a half ago with an all hands meeting with all staff to help us refine the vision for the property and define a path that we could take and that's what's led us this evening. So I want to uh, certainly uh, commend uh, Lucille for all of her efforts. Uh, what we're talking about this evening is not the project. We're talking about a process. And by and large, we agree with uh, the lion's share of the analysis that's been performed to date by your staff. Uh, but we do have some differences of opinion on how, about, how to go about this process. Um, the earlier speaker said that, uh, that this conflicts with the general plan. In fact, what we're doing is implementing the general plan. Uh, the council has really already crossed the bridge as to its policy as to bringing these properties into the city proper. So what we're now talking about is how best to go about this process. Basically, your staff is suggesting a sequential process, meaning package everything together, the boundary changes, the, the land use uh, changes that we're asking to be considered 
package them all together, run it through the city's process before it ever gets to LAFCO. Uh, th that's not a very efficient process. It's costly. It's time consuming. What we're asking is a concurrent process that you pass judgment on the annexation request that in fact it does comply with what your general plan says and bring it forward to LAFCO and certainly the public's welcome to raise the issues of annexation whether or not it's in compliance with the city's general plan or the county at the time LAFCO takes that matter up. And then we're asking that as to the land use changes that we're asking for that that be concurrently processed through your normal uh, channels, that is planning commission first and then ultimately to the city council. Uh, we also are suggesting, again, for reasons of efficiency, that we take advantage of your existing general plan EIR, which was uh, quite a, 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 a lengthy uh, process that, that's already gone through uh, in, in the course of updating your general plan. And there's no reason not to take advantage of that documentation. When we finally get to the end of the day, which are the land use entitlements, the actual subdivision maps and those sort of things, certainly we'd expect additional environmental analysis. But we're dealing at a programmatic level right now and we think it's appropriate we take advantage of the general plan that you have. So those are kind of the two fundamental areas that we have some difference in. Uh, in your packet you, you do have a, a wealth of information that we've offered to you. Uh, what I'd like to just simply draw your attention to is on page four of that supplemental uh, material. Okay. Uh, is it? See, but you know what you're an applicant I'm going to give you a few extra minutes on there. You, you represent the applicant? Yes. Okay, I'm going to give you a few extra minutes on Thank that. you. Go ahead. Uh, I'm not going to go through the, the material verbatim, but I'd like to draw your attention to page four and five. What you have at the bottom of that page is a comparison of how we see the process working versus what staff is recommending to you. And uh, it really just summarizes what I've just stated, but it's given, you know, very concrete uh, language for you to consider as part of an adopting action. So if you are in, in concurrence with uh, the applicant's point of view, uh, it would simply be a matter of uh, endorsing the recommendations that we've listed in that table, the right-hand column. Uh, so uh, I offer that to you to kind of simplify the process. Uh, certainly, as I mentioned, the applicant, uh, the owners, are present this evening and certainly would address you on any questions you might have. Uh, and likewise, I'll be glad to answer any questions in the material that we submitted. But uh, again, we look at this as a process issue, not a project issue. We're not at that point in time to talk about a project. Okay. Um, we'll probably have some questions for you during our deliberations. Fine. Well, thank you. Anyone else? Uh, good evening, Mayor Lingle and council members. I'm Ken Huff. I'm representing the uh, Santa Barbara County Action Network. Uh, my home office is in Santa Maria. Um, SB CAN is a countywide grassroots organization that works to promote social and economic justice, to preserve environmental and agricultural uh, resources, and create sustainable communities. Ten years ago, SB CAN developed a set of principles to help guide planning for for housing, open space, and transportation throughout the county. And these principles have guided our comments on plans and projects over the years. Last month, our board had a retreat, and, and there they reaffirmed these principles. The principles are based on our judgment that there's a serious lack of affordable housing for low income and, and uh, middle class uh, workforce, and that there's a crisis regarding the potential loss of open space and agricultural lands uh, within and outside urban limits as commercial and residential development continues. Two of our housing principles are that uh, market rate housing development should be questioned as a matter of course. New housing development we think could only be justified if it helps low income and working people live in our communities. Development should be planned in accordance with environmental values that respect the need to preserve open space and agricultural uses. Housing should not be placed on land that's important for environmental values and agricultural use. And within the urban limit line, viable agricultural land should be considered for affordable housing only if other appropriate alternatives have been exhausted. And then we have a couple of open space principles that uh, 
that I wanted to highlight. One is land use planning should aim to preserve the ecological integrity and aesthetic quality of open space and environmentally sensitive areas and land used for farming. And another, that zoning changes that erode the long-term viability of agriculture should be avoided. These are the principal reasons why in four years ago, we fought the Bailey uh, Avenue corridor annexation. And these are the reasons why during your deliberations on the general plan process, we urged your council to not include the corridor as a potential expansion area. And again, we urge you now to not move forward with the annexation proposal before you tonight. If you look at a map of the prime ag land in this county, it's really apparent that the vast majority of it is in the Lompoc Valley and the Santa Maria Valley. Ag is the most important industry, and the most important part of our county's economy. Please protect that. Thank you for your attention. I got to ask you. a question. Oh, sure. Sir. Uh, interesting in a lot of your comments now, if we don't build there, where are we going to build these houses in the Lompoc Valley? And I'll tell something later on, but you, you haven't done anything to help us. We are short of housing. We don't have enough housing. They're sold as fast as we can. Mm -hmm. But if you start taking land away that we can't put houses on, then what, so. you, everything you said isn't worthwhile. So I appreciate your comment. I didn't come with the map showing you, well, here's where I think you should build instead. But we'd be happy to, to work on that with the city. OK, thank, thank you. you. Next, please. John Lynn Lompoc resident. As mayor, before our current mayor, I spent a lot of time working with these folks to advance this project, and I'm very proud of some things that are involved, that are, that are contained within it. Um, number one, it is consistent with the general plan, which most of you were on the council and we voted for. Number two, um, the applicant has gone the extra mile with regard to the amount of industrial space within the project, so there's a jobs housing balance which is what SBCAG is looking for in all developments. Now, you're all familiar with the fact that we have some other projects that are approved here in town. And I can tell you from working with each and every one of those people that the difficulty with moving them forward is the projects were designed in a different market, and the product mix that's in them now isn't sellable. Um, the only projects that we were able to move forward, as you'll recall, were Briar Creek and uh, Laurel Crossing because they had the right product at the right place at the right price. We have a critical housing shortage in Lompoc today. We have not built 300 houses that we should have built on average over the last eight years. That has caused a situation where the price of housing has been bid up. One of the speakers mentioned worker housing. Lompoc is one of the few places where someone who two employed persons can buy a home or a condo. But that dream is going away because of the, the dearth of supply. We have someone here with a great project who's ready to go forward, and I would hope you would support them with that. Um, there was a comment about affordable housing, and I think all of you will recall that we have more than our fair share. In Santa Barbara County, we have the largest percentage of affordable housing of any incorporated city. So we've already done that. So we're about 300 houses short right now. Today, we needed 300 houses that haven't been built. And as you all know, what happens with those new homes is you have what's called a step-up buyer. Might be one of you. You're living in an older home, and your wife tells you, because it won't be you, honey, I'd really like to live in a new home. And you go over there and look at it, and because you have a lot of equity in your current home, you step up and buy that home. And what it does is it puts your current home on the market for first-time buyers. So you actually create, with each new house, you create the opportunity for two different families to get a home and move in. Um, I think the, the tack the staff took is completely wrong and, and overly complicated. Uh, what, what was laid out from the consultant is a simple way to move this forward and find out if it's going to get annexed. It's all within the law. Um, hopefully you will give the applicant what they asked for and what they're paying for. Rather than something else, there are people in the Bailey Corridor who do not want to be annexed, 
and to force them to do so is absolutely wrong. A property owner should decide what they want for their property. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Next, please. Good evening, Mayor, City Council, Joyce Howerton, Lompoc. Gosh, I've been coming for almost 30 years <laughs> talking about the Bailey Avenue corridor. And the difference is tonight I look around the room and I see a few people, but there have been times in the past when those back doors were open and there were, this room was packed with people. It was packed with community members. It was packed with farmers. It was packed with business people. And the majority of people have consistently said, don't move on to the property to the west. It's prime ag. That's the food we eat. That's what provides us with our nutrition. When we talk about development, if you look at, at any kind of planning or development, community living 101, it tells you that you don't, you build from your core out. You don't go out and build in because guess what? That doesn't happen. And what we're looking at with Lompoc, we have incredible amount of infill. We have so many facilities in Lompoc where we could go up. I'm not saying that someday, and I used to say in not my lifetime, but I no longer say that because it gets getting closer, but we at some point may have to move on to farmland, but we're far, far reach from there now. So I would consider and ask you to consider to look at how we develop our community, our core first. I mean, we talk about having the need to um, develop a new fire station. I've been to the police station. I'm telling you, it's going to be next. It's, it's pretty crowded. By building more houses, we have to provide more services. And how are we going to pay for that? You cannot build your way out of problems. You've got to take care of what you have first, and then you look at other development. And I appreciate the smiles I see on some of your faces. For 30 years, we've been looking at this and talking about this, but I'm telling you, if you want a livable community that people want to come to, that people want to live in, then you take care of what you have first. And think about it. Think about the downtown today. If we had people living in all those different buildings down there, if we did infill and we had people on the top floor and businesses on the bottom floor, you would actually, at any given time, probably actually see people walking around the community because it would be a community. But the more we build out, we lose that. So I encourage you, let's not look at an annexation. Let's look at putting our core together and making that solid first. Thank you. Thank you. Nicholas Gonzalez, resident and local uh, business person. Uh, Honorable Mayor, City Council, I'm here to encourage you to move forward with the annexation. I work in the real estate field and I can attest to the fact that there is a severe housing shortage. I, I sent all of you an email encouraging you to move forward because it's becoming very unaffordable uh, for many families now. Um, and I'm a firm believer <laughs> that yeah, density will help. And yes, we do need affordable housing, but I'm more a believer in market-driven housing. Um, as we build housing, people move, which creates vacancy, which provides an increase in supply, which naturally brings down rental prices. The large part of our rental prices and housing price increases has been from the short supply. It's basic ec economics. When you have a limited supply and a, and a big demand, prices go up. Also, um, I've served on an affordable housing agency, LHCDC. Uh, I, one of my biggest complaints while I was on uh, the board was that we were building affordable housing 
that was two or three times the cost of market rate housing. That wasn't sustainable. I've reviewed some redevelopments of affordable housing and they're $300,000 a unit. That is not sustainable. I did a calculation and said if we were to house our bottom 25%, how much money would we need? It's billions of dollars. That's not sustainable. The other thing that's not sustainable is we continually are told, and I'm not going to make friends with some of my agricultural buddies here, but um, I, I provided you several weeks ago a report from the EDD, and it gave job clusters. And agriculture was a big job cluster. Unfortunately, 90% of the jobs paid under $10 an hour. That is not sustainable. So when we start hearing a lot of this information, you really have to digest the information for what it is. I'm not saying that building is necessarily going to resolve the problem completely, but it's a start, and you can do both at the same time. So let's get the annexation and let's give some temporary relief. Thank you. Thank you. Next. Anyone else? Council members, hi, I'm Mark Anati, and I am one of the owners of the property. We've been here a long time with you guys. Many of you we've dealt with over and over again. Um, in fact, when the general plan was going through, I know at least three of the members of this current council, including the mayor, have had this discussion that we had talked about before. Those are the visions that the council has set before to go throw forward with this. We've had a, a unanimous vote on, on the general plan. And all we're asking is, as my consultant has said, essentially to move forward with a process. And this process is first and foremost just simply to go to LAFCO because that's all that's necessary, all the other stuff that's city bound, and going to LAFCO with only the members that want to go to LAFCO right now. If others were wanting to, they would have joined in, they haven't. And some people we know are adamantly against becoming part of the city. So let's not include everybody. Let's include just us. We've made the application. We paid for the application. We want our application looked at solely for um, the Bodger piece and our piece. Um, we have an economic study, which was required by the general plan, to show that we have a net positive, which is from prior conversations that we've had with, you, with this council today. Where are we getting money? How are we going to do this? How are we going to have more money? Well, if we do build this out with our economic analysis, the city will generate, this project will generate money. From sales tax, there's a myriad of different things. School fees, uh, other things that you want to do. I know you want a fire station to come in. These things will help balance your budgets. Supply demand, we've said it before, simple economics. You don't have to supply low-income housing if you don't gentrify and you don't force the housing stock to be limited. That's exclusionary zoning. That's causing the people that have it to have those houses go up in price because you're not supplying enough houses onto the market. Um, there's very few lots available, maybe only like 26 or so lots that you could build on in the city at this point. Building is up in a suburban area is not a solution. It's, we are, you have your core, it works, and now Briar Creek, Creek is an example of a well thought through community. We have apartments there, we have a mini storage there, we have all sorts of um, housing, and it's selling, and it's a good project. Um, you have a compact city already, and we're not going beyond the compact area we're building is adjacent to what's already been suburbanized. I won't call it urban, I'll call it suburban. Suburbanized areas. Um, anyway, I do appreciate all your time and all the times that I've been in front of you. And I'd like to hope for a good consideration from you guys and go forward with the process that's been laid out. And my consultant can probably answer more detail anything that you guys need. Or you can, you can ask me questions too. Okay, thank you. All right, thank you.
Anyone else from the public? Okay, we're in close pu uh, public comment. Bring it back to the council. Councilmember Humdahl. <laughs> I see Joyce back there smiling because she knows what I'm going to say. We wouldn't be in this position if it wasn't for Bob Hedlund and Art Hibbets. They're the one that shut us off and made us go into this area. Call a spade a spade. That's what it was. That's what happened. They did not. Now, Art Hibbets goes out and sells all his land and everything else, but he blocks us on going east. And that's where some of the non-prime or poor prime ground. He pushed us to go to the west. And then you got farm owners who had it. Or don't. I'm not excited about putting it on that ground out there, but no place else to go. Yeah, Magalita Canyon doesn't have enough. That's about the only one that he agrees on is go ahead and build in Magalita. I'm talking about Art Hibbets. And I've known him. I graduated with his sister, and she won't even come back and see him. So... I call, I, I call a spade a spade, and Joyce and I have been having this battle ever since. So that's 44 years ago, and she's only knew about 33 years. But I think it's about time we get this project going and get it, get the development. We need the houses. I'm getting tired of Santa Barbara sending all our low-cost housing people here to Lompoc. We need some nice houses. Everybody I talk to that wants a house that's halfway decent, and not all of them. And they're selling. As soon as they start building, the houses sell. I think it's about time, and it's looking good. But I say, uh, you know, I don't want to see the agriculture ground go, but the, the landowner has some rights. And are we going to take his rights away? Now, the piece of ground on the Bodger, it was right next to the park and runs everything, and that housing development, there's no reason why it shouldn't go. The other part, I don't have any problem with it. It's still good prime agriculture ground. There's still some out there. And I think the way I see on some of the project, the way they're going to handle it. I'd like to see it go to LAFCO and see if we can get it annexed instead of fighting it and taking it through a process, maybe take us three or four years just to go through the process. Take it to LAFCO and find out. And it was because, and you know, you people maybe not know what happened. There's a good friend of mine who was on the board of supervisors and uh, he was kicked off because they got an extra one for the LAFCO meeting in 1978, which the original set up for the Lompoc Valley it included Mission Hills and Vandenberg Village and, and Lompoc all in the same uh, area. And of course, they kicked Mission Hills and Vandenberg Village out in Lompoc where it's at. And thanks to Art Hibbets and Bob Hedlund. So that, you know, I, I had this. It's been a battle I've had for years. Joyce is going to shake her head any way she wants to, but this is the truth and I'm not lying about it. Anyone else from the council? Okay, I've got a couple of questions. Uh, um, I'm gonna ask, uh, ask um, Lucille to step up real quick. Uh, Lucille, on the additional information we received from the developer, you have the staff recommendations and the alternative uh, direction for the recommendations. Can you sort of go over those and let us know are you prepared for that? Sure. Okay, good. Um, what the staff is saying is that we, we have not worked on this project at all. Uh, we're asking the council whether you want us to spend staff time. There's going to be considerable staff time that would be spent on this project. And the developer will be paying for that time and uh, any of the associated costs of the development. So what we would be doing would be taking the request from the developer, uh, analyzing it, and looking at what is best for the community. The general plan does show this area within our urban limit line, and uh, the intention of the council when the general plan was adopted was that expansion in that area would be supported. We would uh, look at that. There is also a separate issue, which is the CEQA issue, um, which we, we have some disagreement with the applicant and his representative. Um, because we have not looked at it, we would look at, as required by law, we would look at the CEQA requirements, do an initial study, and it may be that an addendum would be what we would need. But we need time to analyze that and go through the process of 
presenting to you the best information that we have for you to make a decision. So the way that we have laid out the proposal for you to have us uh, analyze it, take it through a public process, we cannot make any decisions on the um, actual development plan because we don't have land use authority over that area. So what we are looking at is the annexation. However, we do have information from the developer about what their intention is, so we would look at that as well. Um, and it does exceed what our general plan actually, what the adoption of the general plan was. It doesn't exceed mm -hmm. what the project description was, but it does exceed the alternative that was adopted by council. So um, we don't believe it's a process that is going to take huge amounts of time, but we do believe that it is a public process uh, that will take these, this request to the Planning Commission, which is your land use uh, recommending board, and then we will bring back a recommendation. We included the entirety of the Bailey Avenue corridor, um, just as a consideration, we understand that there are only two property owners who have applied on this actual annexation request, um, but we wanted to look at the whole project and consider it at the planning commission level when we would come back to the council with options. Okay, so you're still recommending staff, you'd re still recommend staff recommendations as, a to as opposed to the alternative Alternative directions, okay. That's correct. One other quick question. Um, I don't know if you have the number off the top of your head, but if not, just a rough estimate. We have several projects that are currently approved, just waiting to come forward. How many units, how many homes are approximately in those approved projects right now? Oh, we probably have 1,500 units. Okay, but 1,500, okay. Okay, and this project would be for about 300 homes, I believe, 274 or something like that? Yeah, it's less. It's less than that, mm -hmm. okay. Okay, um, thank you. Uh, thank Mr. you. Councilor Mosby. So you said the developer would be paying for the costs. Would the developer paying for the cost for the other parcels that didn't request the annexation as well? Well, that would be part of the discussion and the recommendation to council if if that were to be included, how that could be funded. What are options of how that could be funded? There's a number of different options, but I don't have them necessarily at hand. But we would. It seems if if there's if there's other parcels that aren't requesting the annexation right now, and we have two parcels requesting annexation, and they're going to be funding the cost, it wouldn't necessarily be like a better terms, calling it fair for the two parcels that are requesting annexation to pair for the other parcels that aren't requesting the annexation. And it seems if the other parcels aren't, they might complicate the movement to the other. I can see the efficiency factor for filing and, and noticing and trying to get the whole block. In, in a perfect world, we could move forward that way. But I think it's been as long as 50 years that this was contested. I think 50 years ago they ran a sewer line down there, down Bailey Avenue and such on this. So the, the anticipated movement, and actually I, I got the map off your wall from 1959, which actually showed residential uh, zoning going all the way out well past Union Sugar Avenue. So it's been contested. You know, the original seat of Lompoc was far significant, uh, larger and greater than what we're asking here. Mm -hmm. But I think we'd be complicating the matter if we had other bodies that you're putting through for request for annexation, if they don't want to be. And I know at least one of those gentlemen usually say at every meeting saying no, no, no. So it seems like we'd be almost forcing somebody to do something they didn't want to do, but you'd also be forcing the other bodies who are wanting to be annexed to pay for something else. And maybe in the long run, it might actually be more complicated to do it that way. Potentially, and that would be part of the discussion. Yeah, so maybe, um, they brought some logic to the table by just staying with, as in their, their handout that they have here, parcel A and B, and moving forward with that and not complicating it and making it further. I mean, we already have somebody willing to pay that, so we don't have to worry about how are we going to fund the other parcels. 
Ms. Breeze, could we just also clarify that what you're asking the plan, what you're suggesting we have the planning commission consider is uh, the sphere of influence for those other parcels, and that would not affect the nature of how those property owners handle their property. Well, that's correct. Yes, this the sphere of influence. If we go to LAFCO, and that the sphere of influence and the annexation, all of those parts are something that would be discussed as part of this process. Would we ask for the sphere of influence to go and be all along Bailey Avenue as our urban limit line is now? Um, and if not requesting the annexation at this time makes the most sense, only requesting it for the two property owners that have indicated, then that would be the recommendation. But we would have the opportunity for public input and we would have the opportunity to study it and see what really did make the most sense for the entire community. Councilman Vega. Lucille, um, it seems to me that this process is, has gone forward before with expense being paid by the landowners um, with this same process to get uh, to move forward with this Bailey annexation. Is that your understanding? Have we, at what point did we get before, before we, uh, before this staff recommendation? It seems to me like if it went forward before, it was probably on the same staff recommendation that we have here, which was not a positive thing for the annexation before. Is that correct? Well, in partially in uh, 2007 we received an application in January from um, three of the land owners and at that time our 1997 general plan required a specific plan for that area before any of the properties could be brought in so the circumstances were a bit different the um, contract a contract was signed with a consultant for the specific plan and we began working on that and the environmental document. Uh, we held some public workshops and it was during that year that the council determined that we were going to go forward with our general plan amendment. So the applicant requested that they would uh, be included, their, uh, their actual process would be included in our general plan amendment and not go forward. That's why it did not continue going forward. Okay. I was, uh, I was under the, led to believe that there was a, quite a bit of expense prior also by. Well, there was a contract that was signed and we did a considerable amount of work on, we had a draft specific plan and uh, we did have some workshops on it. So there was a lot of work that was done. So basically by moving forward with just the applicants that are requesting annexation, um, it would be a lot cheaper for the, for the process. Is that correct? Or would the same amount of cost uh, be charged for your time to do this? Okay, would it be less staff time? It would be Less staff time. I mean, instead of requesting the annexation for the whole Bailey corridor, okay? Well, we, we're not necessarily going to request the annexation for the entire Bailey corridor. What we're saying, our recommendation is that you send this to the Planning Commission for them to consider gotcha. and to make a recommendation to you. Does not mean that the recommendation will be for the entire Bailey corridor. It was just an option that okay. could potentially okay. come out of that. I was just that. reading the staff recommendation. Thank you. Okay. Councilman Starbuck. Well, I'll throw my two cents in. I was involved when we did the, the general plan. Um, I've heard the arguments on both sides. <clears throat> and once again, we go back to Lompoc and its growth. Obviously, south is restricted. We are continually here, do not go east, we cannot cross the river, but we have to cross the other river and go north. The north is impeded. We have the mission. We have Mission Hills, Mesa Oaks, the village, protected Burton Mesa Chaparral, the prison. So we're very much contained with what we can do to go to the north. To go to the west and to do the two parcels 
these applicants are here to do, totals approximate, I'm going to use approximate numbers, 136 acres out of a possible 270 acre annexation. Of the less than 6,000 acres out there that's farmable ground, this would represent less than 2% of the farmland. In the value system here, is it hurting the farmer? Are we losing the broccoli or are the gains for the city and the community bigger? I think the needs of the community and the city are bigger than the, the less than 2% of farmland that will be used for this annexation. It would make only good sense to get these applicants as far as they can to LAFCO, the final authority. We know LAFCO can go either way. Why would we have them throw tons of money out and be denied at LAFCO? Let's do the minimum as a city to get them to LAFCO, and then they could process from there. I mean, let's face it, we've lost more acreage to the river flowing and flooding than we've annexed in this city in the same period of time. So we've got to do something here, and I'm totally for the Bodger annexation and for Mr. Anati to go ahead and move these projects forward. Just the two, get them to LAFCO. In our environmental impact report, we've been sued over it, we've been over it, we've updated it. It's all good to go now. It's time for us to take a little step, put our toes in the water, and grow. Okay. Thank you, Lucille. At the request I, of uh, Can I just... Oh, make, sure, go ahead. Just uh, the statement about the environmental impact report. That was a programmatic level environmental impact report that covered our general plan, did not cover specifically development on that area. It did cover the fact that development would cons be uh, an impact that could not be mitigated. But when the city is the applicant going forward to the LAFCO with the application, we're going to have to have an environmental document and we're going to have to do some study on that. We're going to have to do an initial study at a minimum that's going, that's what's going to determine what the actual uh, environmental study is going to be. So there's uh, that process is I'm not understanding. I thought we had the environmental impact report done already. That's where we didn't have the greenhouse gas and, you know, et cetera, et cetera here. The, I mean, I understand the mitigation aspects of it, but what are you going to mitigate? Have gardens, you know? I mean, use more water than the ag's using? I, I don't under... What is the mitigation? Mr. Pedroni? Mr. Mayor, if I may, maybe I can add some assistance. All we're talking about is process. When, when another discretionary action is brought before the city council or before the city, CEQA requires an initial study to be done on that particular, that's a term of art, an initial study to be done on that particular discretionary action, which is what uh, Ms. Breeze is talking about. That initial study will dictate, the results of that initial study will dictate whether we could do a, an addendum, whether we need to do we could have a finding that says we don't need to do anything else because the current EIR is sufficient for the, for the information that is necessary. We don't know, all we're saying now is we don't, we don't know what that initial study will hold. The developer is convinced that the initial study is going to hold that an addendum is sufficient. Maybe that is what will happen. All we're saying is we need to go through that process. Councilor Hamdahl. To follow up on that, in other words, what you're saying is that no matter what, we need to run it through that process. Even they just want to look at those two properties and find out what LAFCO is going to do and it will allow the annexing. Yes. Uh, yeah, the, problem I, the problem we went out there and looked at that originally and adopted it for the city, we looked at how the, the boundary line and what we did and how far it came back in and what we we're going to do is protect that agriculture land going to the west and put a stop to it. I still don't see why they can't go ahead and go through the process to find out on LAFCO and before they want to go ahead and spend all the money on the rest of it. If I may, through the mayor, it's, it's two different questions. There's the environmental question, the CEQA question, and the CEQA process, and the other question is you as policymakers, do you want to um, decide to take the approach that staff is suggesting in looking at it more community-wide and whether you want to annex 
go with an annexation for the entire area, whether you want to only annex for the north and south part, those are policy decisions you need to make separate from what the CEQA process is going to be. We're just suggesting if it goes through the Planning Commission, they will make option recommendations to you as an option for you to make the decision. Uh, you, you are the final determining factor before we go to LAFCO, because it is city application. Anything else for Ms. Breeze? Okay, so at, as re, at a Thank request you. of the, one of the council, or citizens, I'm going to reopen public comment for a few minutes. Mr. Mayor, if I uh, can take advantage of, course, of that of course. <laughs> offer. Um, I have to tell you, as, and I've done this work a lot. I've worked for public agencies. I've worked for developers. And I get really spooked when I hear things like, well, it'll be part of the discussion. Well, whose discussion? You're the decision makers. We need clear direction to be given to staff. As to CEQA, you have a letter here from a prominent attorney that disagrees with the analysis of your staff. And we're asking, accept that analysis. If the city gets sued, we're on the hook. That's how it works. We have to sign our lives away with applications or reimbursement agreements, indemnifications. So we're willing to accept that risk. We have an, an attorney that's, like I say, well-respected, that disagrees with what your staff is telling you. So we would ask you to cut to the chase. You have a general plan, an EIR, that went through a lot of pain and suffering. And all we're asking is let's carry forward what you've already decided would be the, the future of that area and use the very environmental document that led to that decision. The other thing that um, I think is important here, uh, the, um, we heard from the staff saying things like, uh, well, first of all, their numbers are incorrect. There's 620 some odd units that would be involved in this project. Our concern is when we get in, in, involved in a process that's open-ended, and when I hear things like, it'll be part of the discussion, uh, that is uh, very troubling. Uh, your general plan does not say that the whole area has to be annexed as a whole. And we think it would be a mistake, and it would be contrary to some of the interests of the other property owners in between to force them into a, a process that they don't want to be part of. And your general plan allows for this to occur. What the general plan does say is if it take, it's taken down in, in steps, you have to make certain that there's interconnectivity so you don't create isolated neighborhoods that can't, their street system can't work or the infrastructure that's required to serve the balance of properties in between. That's why you have some pretty well-defined plans in here that we worked through the process with your staff a year ago to try to work through those, how do we make sure that this whole thing's going to connect together at the end of the day, if and when those other property owners come on board. So again, I think it's important you give clear direction to staff. And our request to you is allow these two pieces to proceed. Do not require the applicant to entertain or require the applicant to include those additional properties. Allow us to proceed to LAFCO with your policy documents and uh, that will then dictate what we can do uh, in the way of entitlements. And, and, and the entitlements may in fact require additional environmental analysis. We agree, because we're at a program stage. We're not at a project stage. So. Okay, thank you. Any, okay. If I may. Of course. Mark Anadi. Um, we are asking to be very clear that there's two separate items. And we've been before the city council before on a request to annex our property. It didn't require CEQA review. It didn't require anything else. It only requires the city to choose to go to LAFCO. The CEQA review is for the land use portion of what we're supplying, a change in the 
venue of what we're doing, the project, and yes, we, there's some disagreement on whether we can or can't do certain sections, and we would like to have that process go through. But be very clear that we were before city council a long time ago, and we could not get annexed. The city would not move forward on an annexation simply because the whole Bailey corridor had to be studied. $500,000 later, it was studied to death. Okay, and one of the important things you will remember in your general plan that got set up was that we were not going to be required to have the whole Bailey corridor looked at ever again as a whole project. The, specific, the plan specifically was done, was talked about that each of these property owners, myself and Mr. Bodger and everybody else, were allowed to go through with the project on their own. It's in the general plan. Staff may not remember that, but that was a very key component of the general plan. We're asking simply to have the city move forward with a LAFCO annexation, which is well within the boundaries of what you can do. We're willing to have the city direct staff to look at the land use elements and start the process of doing that right now. But at the same time, it's, it's two separate paths that are distinct. The city's either going to annex the property, LAFCO in Santa Barbara is going to allow you to do that, and it's very simple to direct staff to start the LAFCO annexation process or, and furthermore go with the land use process, but keep the two on different paths and not tie them together. That's all we need to do. And if the LAFCO process falls apart, the rest of it's worthless anyway, quite frankly. So we need to know and have clarity and from the city council in that to the Santa Barbara County that the city of Lompoc wants to annex these two pieces of property. They can put whatever influence, square of influence or whatever else they want to do along with that application, however they want to draw it. But that's what we're asking for do and that's what we're asking to pay for, for you guys to do. And if we can do that and move it forward, we'll find out if, if Santa Barbara is even close to interested to allowing you to have that property to move forward with anything else. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Council, for allowing us to uh, speak to this. Uh, I, um, I want to point out to you that there are policies that LAFCO operates by. And in that policy is a secret requirement. As Mr. Pannoni has mentioned, Ms. Breeze has mentioned, that is a requirement of this sphere of influence in this annexation. They're not making it up. Um, I talked to one of the representatives of LAFCO today because I wanted to be prepared to come to the council tonight to see what was going to happen up here. It's not, um, it's, it's, it's a process that's expensive, it's true. But, Mr. What, but, but what Mr. Pannoni and Mr. Breeze are saying to you is this is the process and Anybody who is wanting to um, have a, a, a sphere of influence extended or an annexation has to follow what is in the law. And in the policy of LAFCO, it says, um, a LAFCO sphere of influence determination is subject to review under the provisions of the California Environmental Equality Act in order to enable environmental consideration to be effectively integrated into the sphere of influence determination and environmental review will be conducted concurrently with the development of the sphere of influence determination. So let's get on the same page with LAFCO. Let's do that. And then we won't have a problem later on where somebody's going to come back in and say, did you follow the policy? Did you follow the procedure? I can tell you, um, in, the, in, in, um, in March of 2013, the council was advised of the procedures or the process by a letter from Environmental Defense Center requesting that you follow those, uh, that process. Now here we are in 2016, and that process is coming back again. So let's get this right, please. 
I don't like Lompoc to be looked at with stupid across the forehead. We have to do this. And if it's that way, then that's, that's the way it is. That's the law. Thank you, Council. I hope you make the right decision tonight. If you don't, well, maybe we will have stupid on our head. Thank you. Anyone else? Okay, we're going John Lynn, thank you for the second opportunity. It'll be very short. So with regard to the prior speaker's comments, we have a sequent analysis that we did with regard to the general plan. The applicant feels that that's adequate. However, the staff will conduct a review, as Mr. Pannoni outlined, to verify that it's adequate and any additional work will be done. The process that the staff is recommending is the same thing we did once before. Um, after two years and $500,000, we really got nowhere. I think the applicant has made a good case for moving forward in a simple way. And simple is usually much more successful and complicated. Uh, on the document that was distributed to you from the applicant, in red, there are the steps that they're asking to take. And would like one of you to make a motion to do that so we can get this going forward and we can build some houses while we're all still alive. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Okay, we are going to close public comment, bring it back to the council. Anyone care to make a motion? <laughs> yes, I'm going to move that we go ahead and start the process only on the two properties that are asked to be annexed to the city of Lompoc. And that's how I want to do it because those two are asking for it. When we decided back four years ago, whenever it was, each one of those parcels would have the right to do what they wanted to. They aren't going to be stuck with everything. They have the right to come in when they want to, when their families want to move the property. And I want to just so they can keep it farming as long as we can. So that's why my motion is set up for that. Councilman Mosby? I'll second it. Okay, discussion. Um, I'm going to be voting against this for a couple of reasons. Um, one is that I believe staff is making the better recommendation. I believe that we have policies in place that we're supposed to be abiding by. And with that motion, we're not going to. The other reason I'm going to vote against it is we keep talking about we need these homes, we need these homes, we need these homes. You heard Ms. Bree say we have 1,500 homes currently approved, ready to be built, but no one's building them. You know, I've, I've run for election three times. Each of those times I said that I would move forward with growth out to the west if and when we needed the homes. Um, other than that, I, if it's not necessary, I'm going to be protecting the prime ag land. And yes, it's maybe only 2% of prime ag land, but that is the best prime ag land that I think any of us have ever seen. The main reason is we have 1,500 homes or units already approved. We're not building those. So let's build those 1,500 homes. At that point, come back and we'll see if we want to build another 300 homes. So I'm going to be voting no on this motion. Any other discussion? Councilman Mosby. I think last year we had 53 homes built. The year before last, 55 homes built. We're at a 0.02% housing growth rate right now, the lowest in the history of this town. All right. The first decade of this century, we averaged three-tenths of a percent growth rate, while Santa Maria grew 3%. Our median renter income increased in that time frame 13%. In Santa Maria, that median renter income increased 43%. We're on a serious stagnation. There's a reason why these 1,500 units or whatever they are in town aren't being developed. 
And that is the economy is not pushing because they aren't, the, the numbers don't pencil out. We've had that. We, the people have discussed that. The numbers aren't penciling out. And when the numbers pencil out, they will build them. But you can't force it. And in this case here, we have two people who are actively ready to do this and ready to move. We know, for an example, we challenged our city manager. We challenged our police chief. Find a house in town. And they struggled. We, got a, we have a new captain here who's trying to find a house in town. He's struggling. I don't know what the inventory is now, but it was as low as 13 homes for sale here recently. I think it might be around the 30 mark right now. But homes are going so fast, and, and the prices are going up like this. And we need to exercise all options. And that's why I'm willing. We need, we need to make the movement and exercise the option. I'm not asking to force guys who don't want annexations, but we have two guys that are ready to go. And that's why I second uh, Council Member Holmdahl's motion. Okay, any, oh, I'm sorry. Yes, um, just a clarification on the motion. The motion is for staff's recommendation on process with the exception of only including the two parcels from the applicants. Could we confirm that from the council, please? The, can the developer comment on that? Is, that? is that something that works on the clarity? If I might, Mr. Mayor. Um, no, our request is the two parcels by themselves, but to authorize submittal to LAFCO so that we don't continue to spin our wheels uh, internally here. Is that what you're looking for, Councilman? That's what I understood his motion to be. Thank you. So it would not go to the Planning Commission? Correct. Okay, so it's been moved and seconded. Any further discussion? Let's vote. And that passes 4-1. Okay, thank you. Just for the record, I want to make it clear that you're not saying don't follow CEQA as we, your staff, think CEQA has to be followed through the initial study or whatever. You're just saying the only thing we're going to look at are the two sites going to LAFCO. Okay. okay. Thank you. Congratulations, applicants. Okay, written communication. Nothing. Oral communications. This is your last opportunity to speak to us for up to two minutes on any item. Seeing no one move forward, we're going to close oral communication, bring it back to the council for council requests, comments, and meeting reports. We'll start with Councilmember Mosby. Um, one report I went to the uh, CalCog meeting. Uh, got a whole slog of information if you guys want to talk about the lovely stuff about funding for highways and what we don't have and where we're going uh two days of yes but i have i have a lot of interesting stuff here if anybody wants to talk to me about it um i would also like to comment on the sb cag letter if any of you guys got that um when they're talking about for the robinson bridge and potential uh some flashing lights and some other signs some permanent signage to address pedestrians on on the bridge while I was up at SBCAG, I had an opportunity to talk with some of the Caltowns reps and asked why they were doing this as well, if they could uh, initially look into reducing to a 45 mile an hour speed limit um, out there as well. So they're going to look at that as well as with these other two items. So other good things there. Um, I wanted to make a, a council request again. I had made it before at the, at the last meeting on the enterprise reimbursement study. And if I could um, try it again one more time, I had three questions that I made a request that they um, move forward through Brad Wilkie to the consultant and to come back with a um, um, simple answer, nothing too complicated, uh, and I can run at them real fast again, and that is about uh, um, the electric enterprise getting credit for paying for lighting for the streets and solid waste getting credit for um, right-of-way maintenance that they provide by paying for um, street sweeping. And the third one was um, how they came up a little more, uh, um, a little longer analysis of how they came up with the valuation of the wastewater plant to be approximately $195 million dated of 1992. Um, so I, I just kind of was a little out of the ordinary, I felt, that I should have to make a council request. I have three questions going to the consultant. I think it was also a little out of the ordinary that the consultant wasn't here that night, so we could discuss an item. It was a about a $5 million um, reimbursement uh, study that's an annual new methodology. Um, so I have to make a council request to maybe have these three questions move forward. 
I'll give you a second on it again. I'll give you a third on that one. Okay. Uh, it's been moved, second and third. We don't have to vote on that. Just three. Yeah. Okay. Um, that's it. That's it. Councilman Starbuck. No reports. Councilman Vega. <clears throat> Nothing to report. Councilman Homdahl. Yeah, I, uh, after some discussion with others and such, I think we need to take a look at the zoning in the at the ghetto again, the wine ghetto, and the idea that we there are some issues on uh, having some food and other things done. Or we're having some of uh, the wineries starting to move and look at moving to Buellton because there is no place for food or other lodging. Uh, we we spend our time on looking at uh, signs and flags, and I'd like to have the, come back to the council for a discussion on the zoning in the ghetto and see how we can go ahead and kind of move it along so people understand that we do want to put it in there. That work? Okay. Yeah, I'll second that. Uh, do we have a third on that? I'll give a third. Okay, that's been first, second, and third, so okay. Um, my report is on uh, March 30th, 31st, I w drove up to Roseville for an NCPA meeting. Uh, the city paid for my hotel and mileage. I drove my own vehicle. And good news and bad news out of that, re that meeting. Um, good news is the reservoirs up in Northern California, where we get a lot of the water for our hydro plants, the reservoirs are full and they're having to do releases um, to prevent flooding. The bad news is their reservoirs are full because the snowpack is melting so fast and there's concern we will not have a good snowpack to sustain us for the rest of the, of the year. So full reservoirs, but probably not enough snow to keep them full. So that is my report. And this meeting is adjourned to the regular city council meeting of um, April 19th, 5.30 p.m. right here at City Hall. Good night. Thank you.